Good afternoon and welcome to part three of the Finance Leaders uh, webinar series. We're so excited to welcome you all here today. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're so excited. We've got an action-packed schedule, two and a half hours of amazing speakers joining us from, from all over Europe. So we're, we're really happy about uh, everyone going to be popping in and out and uh, sharing their insights. So uh, I'd like to take a moment on behalf of Cube and just I'd like to thank very much our uh, um, CFO ICPAC committee. I will be introducing you to Stavros uh, shortly who will be saying a few words uh, on behalf of uh, the CFO committee. It's been an amazing collaboration with them and we're so pleased to, to, to have had a chance to build and develop this amazing uh, model. And uh, we've uh, managed over the past uh, four months to build uh, an amazing ecosystem of three and a half thousand uh, finance uh, professionals uh, in and around Cyprus and Europe, which has been incredible. We have also managed over all three parts of the event a series to um, manage to double the participants on all these webinars. So we're expecting close to 200 people on today's webinar. So quite a lot of people, uh, amazing uh, presentations lined up. And I hope you stay on to the end where we have a very special presentation from uh, the head of, uh, Vice President uh, of Innovation of MasterCard. Uh, we also are very honored to be having the Deputy Minister of innovation who will be joining us for a 10 minute keynote so please hold on for that he shall be joining us very very soon um, i have uh, the great opportunity of uh, thanking our sponsors uh, for the generosity on this event so thank you so so much to pwc and i'm just at the great timing of service right now so thank you very much to pwc for the generous uh, sponsoring of today's event Thank you also so much to RCB Bank for powering the whole Finance Leaders webinar series. So thank you so much for that. Uh, it's been incredible to have that support. Um, it's, it's of course uh, fundamental to, to thank the speakers that are taking the time to offer their insights today. I know that we feel that we all miss the networking element and the human element of conferences. But it's also amazing how digital events give us a tangibility to access these amazing CFOs who typically can never make it out to these events. So it's great that we have access to them through this series. So we're very privileged and, and happy about that. Um, it, it doesn't go amiss to thank the CUBE team. So thank you to the CUBE team for all their support. Mike has done an incredible job. I know it's been a challenge with all these CFOs uh, trying to get their, their schedules to match with our agendas. But thank you so much, Mike. Incredible job. Everyone behind the scenes at CUBE, thank you. Raluca, uh, Panayoti, everybody. Um, we have got technical support with Panayoti for anyone that is struggling to get online or any problems with sound. He will put his contact information on the chat. So if you want to share with your team members or anyone that's having any technical issues. But in any case, let's get started. I'm handing over to Stavros uh, Katamis, who is a partner and um, CFO of PwC and also Vice Chairman of the ICPAC CFO Committee. Incredible support. Thank you, Stavros. I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Colleagues, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, the third and the last one of a series of three webinars that the CFO Committee of the Institute of Certified Public Accounts of Cyprus is organizing in cooperation with CUBE events. Businesses operate in a very challenging environment due to the pandemic with unprecedented and ongoing economic governance and regulatory changes. To adapt, CFOs need to change and as their role has been shifted from focusing on traditional finance activities to being a trusted business partner. According to the recent PwC CFO Pulse survey in the summer, CFOs recognize the benefits of technology, with 73% of respondents stating that investments in technology will make their company better in the long run. So, CFOs invest their time on emerging priorities such as strategic analysis and planning, stakeholders management, business transformation, risk management, regulation and compliance, performance management, and of course, digital transformation. Digital transformation is the integration of digital technology into all areas of business, fundamentally changing how we operate and deliver value to our stakeholders, 
business associates, and clients. It is also a cultural change that requires businesses to continually challenge the status quo, experiment, and get comfortable with failure. In this framework, CFO aims to create value, to support and protect their business by securing its smooth and uninterrupted operation, while at the same time they contribute, they contribute to the business's sustainability and growth. I am certain that our speakers who will be sharing with us their knowledge and experiences will be contributing in this direction. Before we proceed with the webinar, please allow me to say a few words and introduce to you the CFO committee. The committee was established five years ago under the umbrella of the Institute of Certified Public Accounts of Cyprus with the aspiration of creating a channel of communication between the CFOs and the finance people in general. Part of its activities, of course, is to support the CFO's community with targeted conferences and webinars and through various programs, one of which is the mentoring program. The mentoring program was launched in the summer of 2019, and the first phase was run the period from September to, uh, 19 to March 20, with a great success. Those of you who attended the first webinar, two webinars, you had the opportunity to hear from our colleague and instigator of the program, Sophocles Dimbiose, and his guest, the benefits of the Now we are ready to run the second phase. So in case you are inter interested to participate, either as a mentor or as a mentee, please contact at the details shown in the slide. Finally, I would like to thank all the people who made these three webinars a success. I would like to personally thank Lily, <laughs> Lily Pablo and her team at Hubivens for the organization, contribution and support during this journey. Of course, all the sponsors, contributors and supporters, all the speakers for sharing their knowledge and experiences with us. I would like to I thank, like thank uh, Harry Xenophobia, the chairman of the three webinars. And last but not least, of course, all of you colleagues for your participation and support on this time. Thank you very much. Lily, back to you. Thank you so much, Stavros. Great words and thank you for all that support once more. I'm handing over to our forum uh, chairman, Harry Xenofondos from RCB and George Giorgio, who's uh, with Politis and with Bloomberg. So thank you so much and I wish you all a great event. Thank you so much and enjoy it. Thank you, Lily. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon from uh, this cloudy Limassol today. Uh, uh, and uh, under our, uh, let's say, uh, city lockdown. <laughs> um, I'm here today for this third part. It's a pleasure to be back and conclude on this webinar series, a dynamic series uh, tailored for the CFOs, for the finance leaders, uh, for all types of industries. Uh, we're proud as an RCB to power this event uh, with CUBE and as well as, uh, thank you Stavros, to uh, with the co-organizer ICPAC. Uh, as you all know, CELC is the biggest and, and the most professional association in Cyprus, and it's always a pleasure to put together this level of events uh, in, the, in the local market. Um, our aim is to facilitate this uh, two-hour short and, and pleasant gathering between C-level professionals uh, that can gain insights, uh, knowledge, value-add knowledge from industry experts, um, or just simply uh, hear the opinions of colleagues uh, uh, in that area of profession. Also, I believe it's a great opportunity to network. So um, uh, even though we're doing it remotely, uh, you can see the tab on the people to see who is involved. Um, also, um, uh, look at the, the chat and the post. I will encourage you to get involved, um, uh, ask questions, uh, and make this uh, more interactive and as much as pleasant as possible. We're here to have fun. Uh, we're here to relax a bit from our hectic, you know, daily schedules. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, you're all extremely busy and you rarely find some relaxing times. And, and I hope you get a lot of insight as well. Um, 
going back to the starting from the from the first webinar uh, so we started with leading the future which had a focus on the financial leadership and the role of the evolving CFO uh, as well as the importance of business partnering um, so leading the financial strategy so this was part one uh, that uh, slowly uh, given us the uh, opportunity to move into part two, which is driving performance. Uh, this was interesting to see how it was linked, uh, basically because you know the strategy and the partnering, as well as uh, uh, you know the the role of the CFO is what helps the performance, you know, the, 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 the return of investment, maximizing the return of investment, as well as the utilization of uh, digitalization. And, and finally, we're here today, uh, naturally moving into the digital transformation, which is the third part, and probably the, the most interesting or the most, let's say, relevant or hot topic uh, uh, at the time uh, for CFOs, for financial leaders, and uh, let's hear it from the experts. Uh, definitely, we have an esteemed lineup of speakers, and we're excited to, to hear from, from the panelists, um, as well as uh, the experts about the trends, the innovation in finance, data-driven insights, uh, as well as the importance of digitalization. So uh, we can go ahead and start with our esteemed keynote speaker, Kiriakos Kokinos. Uh, the Deputy Minister to the President for Research, Innovation and Digital Policy of the Republic of Cyprus. Um, Kyriakos is a veteran IBM Europe executive uh, with a vast background in the field. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen um, uh, the progress already and, and positive impact he's been making with the, uh, the e-government. Uh, and actually, I also had the experience with RCB back to partner with uh, Kyriakos and, and his sub-ministry to um, uh, work with Ariadne and the CY login and give the opportunity for citizens to uh, identify, verify their identification on the platform using uh, their internet banking credentials, uh, utilizing the the bank's open banking API. So uh, um, we're looking forward to hear of a lot more uh, uh, projects and initiatives from, from the sub-minister. And, and let's hear it from Kiriakos into unlocking the digital future. Uh, thank you, Harry. Thank you all for inviting me to address this uh, esteemed audience uh, and uh, a community of professionals in the finance profession. It's quite interesting um, that um, this seminar is primarily addressed. Uh, the audience is in the finance profession, and uh, I enjoyed what uh, Stavros said at the beginning and during the introduction that what is the new role of the uh, finance uh, uh, of the CFO? It's a value creator. Uh, it's not just the accounting or the financial assets of, of the organization that uh, he or she has to, to address, uh, but also uh, it's uh, all about the, the human capital, that's very important, uh, as well as the data, a new form of capital. And it's extremely important to understand that data is probably the most important asset uh, to, uh, to learn uh, as a new topic uh, to address. But let's start from the beginning. We are living in very, very different and interesting times, challenging times. The topic of digitalization, it's actually not a technological uh, challenge. It has to do with our global challenges like the aging of population or the shifting of economic power. You see the figurehead uh, in, 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 the, in, in the, the silhouette in this, on this slide. It has to do about the, the 
the confrontation between East and West, between China and the Western uh, world, uh, the, the mobility of, civil, uh, of people between countries, between geographies, the immigration problem, the climate change, and above all, now the pandemic. So these are the problems that technology and digitalization is uh, geared to address. And now I want to present to you uh, if Cyprus is indeed uh, in a position to, to play this, uh, this role and, and address this. This is the Digital Economy and Society Index. It's an annual um, uh, exercise or uh, um, and benchmarking of all European economies. And we see that, and, and, and this DESI index, as it is called, uh, Digital Economy and Society Index, uh, has five very specific pillars. Connectivity, human capital, use of internet, integration of digital technology and digital public services. And as you can see from this slide, uh, Cyprus uh, is not uh, high on, on, on the ranking. It's um, our ranking is uh, 23, 24 out of the 27 uh, European Union countries. And um, going to the next slide, you will see that, uh, and, and, and there is an agreement between this slide and the previous one, that our biggest challenge in Cyprus is talent management, is our talent pool in terms of, this is the Digital Competitiveness Index from IMD. Our overall ranking this year is 40 out of 63 countries. Uh, last year, our ranking was 54. So we improved on a number of aspects, but we still have a long way to go. And the reason, uh, the, our primary focus, uh, I'm sorry, the primary attribute for this improvement is because of our attitude and appetite to go through this digital journey transformation through the creation of the new ministry that uh, I am honored to lead, as well as through the way that Cyprus has been uh, uh, addressing the challenges uh, of COVID in, uh, in the first lockdown, March, April, uh, and uh, until June, when this publication was uh, uh, published, uh, that uh, Cyprus managed using the digital technology to really address in a very effective way, along with other ministries like the Minister of Health, the Minister of Labor, uh, the, the challenges associated with uh, COVID. Now, this slide is very interesting. This is just two weeks uh, ago. It is the global leadership on innovation. This is the good news. Cyprus has the potential of digital innovation. Uh, we are number two in our region after Israel, it's Cyprus, and then it's uh, UAB, primarily Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So, uh, yes, we have a long way to go, but yes, we can make it happen because we do have the intellectual capital, we do have the innovation capacity, we do have the in innovative entrepreneurial spirit that is required to go through this journey. And uh, allow me to say that when I say um, that we have to go through this journey, there are two, uh, two things that we should have in mind. One is a digital transformation of our country in terms of competitiveness and efficiency and effectiveness that I will describe. But there is another pillar that is extremely important. Cyprus can and should become a regional player for high-tech digital technologies in the region as a new pillar of economic activity. So we need to establish Cyprus and build our brand as a digitally uh, mature geography that has a new form of industry. This is a new form of uh, economic uh, activity that uh, we need to address and is very important. So through the ministry, the, that uh, I am leading. Our vision is to build a knowledge-based digital economy and society uh, that uh, can help us uh, support uh, through our reliable structures uh, to ensure sustainable growth, 
prosperity and uh, and uh, efficient operation of our country now on our mission statement which was the result uh, of a two days workshop that i ran at the ministry you will notice that there's no mentioning on technology at the center of our mission is the citizen and the business community so our mission is to continuously enhance the quality of life of our citizens through technology exploitation technology exploitation is an enabler is not uh, uh it's not our target and uh, we need to improve through this the overall citizen and business experience throughout all of their interactions at touch points with the public sector in this aspect uh, we created um, uh, what we call our digital policy pillars one is digital government which has to do with the automation of the government the other one is the digital society and economy which includes the national aspect the digital literacy the culture of innovation a strong ict sector as a new industry and uh, the digitally intensive industries and of course you know uh, this uh, uh, these pillars uh, i will not read them all uh, it's very important to understand that for each one of these pillars, you need structures and operating models, and it's it's a very long journey uh, to to go through uh, all of these. So this journey has just started. Uh, we are realizing very good benefits and very good results, but the real um, outcome uh, it's going to take uh, quite a number of of years, uh, probably and uh, in, it will take two to three years to realize a fully, uh, for example, a fully um, digital government. So for this reason, um, we, we, are pro we are approaching the government transformation uh, with short-term solutions, uh, and in total we uh, we undertook to digitalize within the next 24 months uh, 116 government services like the interaction with the, uh, the company's registrar's office or the town planning or the, um, uh, the interaction with uh, the court system, our legal system. All these things uh, have been uh, uh, noted down as an inventory of 164 to be more precise government services that we started to digitalize uh, and at the same time we have a, a set of projects we call them mega projects long-term projects that will take two to five years to implement uh, such as uh, the the government uh, the sorry the the hospital the hospital automation system which is a 50 million euro project or the digital transformation of the ministry of, of education and our schooling system a 25 million euro project so our early wins our low-hanging fruits are the 160 government services that we are already started to transform uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, for this purpose we are setting up with the help of the uh, of the digital government services of the of the united kingdom of, of uk uh, to help us set up what we call the digital services factory what is the, the purpose of this digital services factory it's a mechanism a platform and a framework uh, that uh, we're building for the accelerated delivery of these 160 government services it's the model that is being used in in uk and it's a model that is also being used in uh, estonia um, we aspire that through this uh, digital services factory we will be able to deliver the majority of these uh, 116 government services and some of them have been already delivered and more will be announced within the next uh, three months about uh, 16 government services will be announced in the next uh, six months at the same time we do have the large-scale projects that uh, will take years to implement uh, we don't lose sight of of these it's just that these projects are very complex 
and uh, very um, sorry I don't know why this has been lost okay uh, so uh, the justice system which is uh, a two-year project the health national system it's a five-year project the school management system it's a three-year project but of course uh, you know we need to also upgrade the some of our infrastructures like a QE system for the citizen service centers uh, we just signed last month um, a 30 million euro projects for the uh, transformation and the digital transformation of the tax department uh, of the of the government so all these things are what uh, we are doing uh, at this stage um, now it's very important to mention that in parallel to these uh, government transformations we need uh, to introduce blockchain and distributed ledger technology uh, into our system and uh, for this reason uh, we um, sorry just a minute Just a minute, something is... Uh... So, blockchain is uh, an important uh, enabler of our strategy and uh, we will submit, uh, we are working now on uh, on the technological infrastructure as well as the legal and regulatory framework for blockchain and cryptocurrency and will it be submitted to the uh, it will be submitted to the parliament the bill uh, within the next couple of months so that blockchain is uh, high on our agenda why is this important because uh, a lot of investors a lot of uh, from uh, other geographies uh, want to invest in cyprus but they want to Oh, they expect us to have a strong and uh, and compliant to the EU regulations uh, on how we how we approach uh, distributed ledger technologies. Another important exercise that we are doing is our strategy for artificial intelligence. Uh, we are currently um, uh, working on our AI strategy, and this is extremely important for developing an ethical and reliable artificial intelligence framework uh, and uh, this is also very important for you as professionals because what is artificial intelligence it's, pra it's practically data science is the exploitation of data um, so what I wanted to to say is that uh, this is a long journey and it's very important to understand that uh, the key ingredient from, for achieving all this is the collaboration with the private sector, is the development and enhancement of our talent pool. You have seen that we are scoring very low in terms of availability of skills on digital transformation in Cyprus. And uh, we are working at the moment for uh, short and long-term interventions. Uh, short-term in interventions have to do with upskilling of current workforce, digital skills and training and certification, in cross-sectoral competencies like project management, AI, data sciences, uh, digital fitness uh, enhancements at all levels of the society, uh, depending on, on the needs of, the, of, uh, of each demographic uh, segment. But at the same time, uh, we are working with the Ministry of Education for intervention on our, on our in educational curriculum for promoting STEM education and ICT career path, something that at the moment, uh, ICT career path is not uh, high on the agenda of our prospective future knowledge workers, our students of uh, today. Um, so, I will conclude this uh, conversation by saying that digital transformation has started in Cyprus, it's a dynamic, iterative process uh, that uh, calls for the collaboration of the private sector with the government and academia. It's a long journey, 
uh, but uh, we are very confident that uh, with the help of uh, the private sector and academia uh, and hard work at the ministry level, uh, we are will be able to realize uh, benefits immediately within the next uh, 12 months. We should expect to see uh, a lot of uh, new services in the public sector, uh, new competencies, but also uh, we are working with the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Interior for um, a new strategy on uh, how to make Cyprus a high-tech regional hub for digital services. And in this uh, context, uh, we are in conversation with um, ecosystems from Israel, from the United States and other geographies. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you my aspirations, uh, my ministry plans, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Griagos. It's such a pleasure to have you today and, and really to hear about the plans of the ministry. Uh, and we really look forward to it. Uh, totally agree that it's a continuous journey and with some agile approach, we should uh, all uh, put whatever we can into this help. Uh, very interesting also to hear that Cyprus is number two with the potential to become an innovation center. And, mm -hmm. and that is, I mean, it's fantastic. And I think uh, uh, it's it's good time and uh, and I'm positive and optimistic that with your uh, with your efforts that we will uh, achieve uh, and especially what you mentioned about the, the ICT being one of the uh, top uh, let's say educational aspirations for, yeah. for young, uh, citizens. Your role as professionals in the finance sector is extremely important in this journey. Uh, we are already uh, uh, drawing the attention from investors uh, in Silicon Valley just because the ministry now is giving this uh, possibility, this protection that Cyprus can and should be. Um, last night I had a call with um, a very um, prominent venture capital from Silicon Valley that uh, they want to set up operation in Cyprus not just for Cyprus, but because our geography as well uh, uh, and other attributes like uh, our innovative, innovative entrepreneurship rankings that uh, I've just shown to you, uh, triggered their reach out to us and they said, we want to talk business with you, we want to do business with you and make Cyprus our regional hub for our innovation activity and, uh, and in the region. So uh, this is excellent news. I mean, yeah. This is great to hear, and, and, and bravo. I mean, this is this is a type of investments that we want to exactly. Cyprus. So, uh, your, your role as finance leader is you are value creators. You are managing not just the financial capital but also the data capital of your organization. And there is no business strategy and digital strategy. This is only business strategy. Digital is part of every business strategy. That's my key message. Yeah. That's great news, Mr. Kokinos. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. And uh, Thank you. I all the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, George, you want to say something before I uh, maybe invite uh, the uh, just, first panel? Uh, I would like, just like yeah. to say that I'm happy to be part of this panel. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to learn from your distinguished guests. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking forward to learn more things about the transformation. I'm a reformist by heart. And I'm looking to learn more about the new developments. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. If we can trigger the audience to start asking questions, uh, to participate in the chat, uh, if they answer questions, uh, uh, Let's get it interactive. Uh, feel free, George, to also uh, raise any questions uh, just to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, motivate everyone. Uh, there's also the first panel, uh, the, the first poll question is also live, so for anyone who wants to answer it. And, uh, and there it is, my first panel. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, hello, uh, Jeremy. 
Pickles um, from Spain. Uh, Jeremy is uh, uh, a, a, an expert in uh, finance controlling, working with uh, L'Oreal, uh, the, probably the, the number one uh, cosmetics company in the world. Uh, hi, Jeremy. Uh, we have also Matthias. Hi, Matthias. Matthias Hello, Weber everyone. is joining us from Germany. Uh, Matthias is a veteran in the pharmaceutical industry, a veteran in, in, in finance, working with uh, 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 um, Santos, Santos, which right is now. a daughter from Novartis. Uh. Yes, which is a, a subsidiary of Novartis. Uh, Novartis is uh, one of the top pharmaceuticals uh, uh, in the world. Uh, and we'll hear some interesting uh, things about Matthias. Uh, his involvement in AI and so on. Uh, Farouk, welcome. Uh, Farouk Aisoy, he's uh, the uh, CFO of uh, Eastern Europe in uh, Lacoste, um, Lacoste and Gantt. Uh, thanks for joining us again, Farouk. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is safe as well in their locations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And last but not least, Mihalis. Hi, Mihalis. Uh, Mihali Hi, uh, uh, Financial uh, uh, Group Finance Operations Manager in Google. Um, he's based in uh, Ireland, but he's handling uh, multiple regions, including you know Europe, uh, US, and um, if I'm forgetting something, just. <laughs> no, in in, in me and Latin America. In me and Latin America. Okay, very good, very good. So thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So uh, today's topic, as, as you all see in the agenda, basically in this panel, is to uh, start off this, what, what, what is our scope, basically, you know, the digital transformation in finance. Because uh, there's digital transformation in many things. But let's, let's start by defining, I mean, uh, what is it for, for our finance leaders? What is it for, for our CFOs? Um, um, Mihaly, you want to start? Yes, I can definitely do that. And again, hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. So, um, like in this journey of digital transformation, like uh, similar to what the, the deputy minister said before, like we have to think that the CFOs are not typical controllers anymore, right? We are really change leads. And we have to, as the connective tissue between the different departments within the company, as change leads, we need to pretty much being able to bring all those departments together and digitally transform them to be able to make a, a, a very fast and like growing a company and the companies of the future, right? So if I would just narrow it down in four things, in very simple four things, if I can just narrow it down because it's a broader topic, the four things that would come to mind uh, for digital transformation that would be super important would be automation, uh, visualization, predictive modeling and analytics, and the most important of all is empowering employees. Uh, now, if I take one by one very, in a very short way, to not take much of the time, from automation perspective, the target is to really pretty much eliminate all manual processes uh, to create you know, the space for people to do high value adding work. Let's say, for example, reconciliations or like task, controlling tasks that people should do before manually to be fully, completely automated. Uh, uh, things like you know accounts receivable or collections or things that will engage uh, that people in finance before they'll have to spend a, a big amount of time responding let's say questions we transfer them to bots so the bots right now within a fraction of time can actually answer all questions that internal or external customers have without actually any human interaction then we go to the visualization piece the visualization is also very important because it's really our work is really being able to get large, huge amounts of data sets and being able to, to create them in a way which is actually uh, understandable by all audiences. What I mean is that when my account manager or marketeer is out on the field and he's trying to book a, a deal, a sale, he doesn't have to call someone from finance uh, and ask them for information that will make take a big amount of time to deliver that to the client, but rather with a simple click on his or her phone can have access, visual access to all the data, easily understandable, and can be within a fraction of seconds, within minutes, have access to that, close the deal with the customer, and really help the strategic decision making going much faster. Then the third piece, as I mentioned, is the predictive modeling and analytics, right? So again, this is connected also with visualization, and it's really applying 
machine learning uh, and AI to be able to make uh, good decisions, forecasting decisions with the data that we have, with the historical data that we have. And that also is connected with the last piece, with the empowering employees piece. And what I say that is that because to be able to develop technologies like that, our skill sets in finance needs to completely change moving forward, right? So an account that like an ACCA or a CPA is not sufficient anymore for this job. Like we have to have skills like being able to, let's say, run SQL, uh, write programming languages in R or Python, because all these things, all this computer programming knowledge will be able to help you build the algorithms that can use the predictive modeling and be able to deliver the digital transformation that, you know, it's, it's needed. And then That's very good. Going, yeah. going to the last piece, and I'm sorry for extending too much, the empowering employees, is that all those three things in advance will create jobs uh, of high skill set and high value adding jobs that will be, uh, and together with a growth mindset and their growth mindset culture within a company, will be able to create the future leader of future leaders of tomorrow. That you know that they will be able to allocate their amount of time on the most high high value adding task that will actually be able, from a risk management perspective, protect the company, and from a growth perspective also, uh, be actually have them actually involved in actually growing the company from a revenue perspective. Definitely empowering employees. It's it's one of the you know most important and, and, and thank you, Michalis. It actually fits the, the 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 fact you said that you know financial leaders need to have in their teams you know technical knowledge. It fits also to what the deputy minister said about you know ICT in our education. And and, and thank you for that. Uh, moving to Matthias. Matthias is is coming also. I mean before he he, he joined Novartis, he he was. Uh, in, in banking and finance as well. Uh, but uh, when we talk about digital transformation in finance, of course, we're not talking about uh, the banking or the financial services industry. Uh, what, uh, what are your views, Matthias, in, 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 um, in, in the audience today for being CFOs or being you know, leaders in all these other industries? I mean, now you're in pharmaceutical. How do you see transformation in the finance uh, of the company, you know, in, the, in, in financial controlling the company. Yeah, thank you, Harry, and uh, uh, happy to be here. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I mean, Michalis uh, described uh, a bit the journey, uh, the, the topics we had been responsible for in the past uh, were not very, very attractive. Yeah, I mean, uh, recording transactions, inputting transactions. Yeah. We, we did it. Um, we uh, we did it well in most cases, but that's not what uh, kind of excited us. So I think now now is the phase with uh, with a huge opportunity and expectation. But I would also say some some responsibility with weight on the shoulder that that we as as finance and CFOs are not sitting on the sideline and and watching these new opportunities with new technology emerging, but that we become a, a driver. And I think within the um, management teams we uh, we probably have some advantage since we are used to do some analytical work doing uh, data work doing um, or being close to it sometimes it reporting to us often having colleagues with some background in in statistical methodologies so so we have um, a huge um, i would say responsibility to to embrace these new technologies and as the um, City Minister, I think correctly said, there's expectations that we are, do not only kind of produce statements, but we create value. And by, by understanding and embracing these new technologies, AI, uh, blockchains, or, or predictive modeling, whatever name you want to use, we can help the company move forward. And now I think the, the, the um, interesting question for all of us, how, how can we use this role and make a difference to, to the company and, and, and to the value we create? And I think this is the, the final um, expectations to us as finance representatives. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. So, Farouk, um, are we talking about a big step towards finance transformation and how big it is? Pretty huge. Uh, definitely, actually. Uh, the finance transformation has already begun a while ago. However, after the pandemic, uh, it boosted up its speed and it's becoming more and more part of our lives. Uh, especially after upon implementation and wide use of 5G, uh, legs and delays in our uh, lives will be mostly eliminated. 
and we will be much more connected and the Internet of Things will be a greater part of our lives. Uh, in retail, even now, uh, we already started to observe examples of retail, uh, brick and mortar stores without any cash registers uh, or sales assistance. Uh, we saw this kind of concept stores recently and once a customer enters into a store, it is being recognized automatically and whatever they pick from the shelves, it is being added to their digital basket and once they leave, it is being directly charged to their cards or other digital payment solutions. Of course, uh, some of you might know it, some of uh, you might be interested in it. If someone want to know more, they can search for Amazon Go uh, and they can begin to it a bit more over the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, along with the digital transformation, uh, we see that the cash circulation also getting minimized, especially after COVID-19, uh, we observed this significantly in our retail operations. Uh, we, are, we are observing it from our cash transactions uh, recognized or realized in our physical stores, as well as cash on delivery requests in our websites. Uh, without any physical circulation of the cash, we are turning into cashless economies and societies. Uh, a few countries are already ready uh, for this transition, like Sweden, Finland, or Australia. They are almost 100% ready for the cashless economy. And so, many other so how, how is the cashless economy, economy impacting? Sorry if I interrupted. So, how is the cashless economy impacting the finance operations or the or the, the finance controlling? I mean, is it? Uh, I, I mean, I, I can I can say it's a great value, of it, but. Uh, um, how is that going to to change, or is there a change already? Uh, uh, there are already, as I mentioned, in our countries, it is not 100% cashless yet. But in some of the countries, they are almost turning into 100%. If you ever visited Sweden, for instance, you can observe it easily. Uh, how it is impacting is, first of all, the visibility and traceability of the cash flow is okay. much more easier. Uh, also, from the government side, they are able to watch all the moments and trace them easier as well and in addition to that also it will be the uh, in some sections it will be lesser cost because you don't need to count the cash or cash collection or etc in the stores of course and, of and course. you can also transform yourself into more digital as i mentioned just a moment ago there are examples of for example a fully digital almost with the payment solutions uh, examples of the brick and mortar stores and uh, this can be a bridge to it as well, because if you don't need Excellent. to transact any cash, you can also turn into fully digital brick and mortar stores. This Thank is you, Parik, and I'll step. come back to you. Thank you on this. Um, jo Jomi, um, we've heard from Michalis, who is coming from Google, where are the, you know, some of the digital tools or, or the, the key pillars. But what about, I mean, from, from your point of view, I mean, from, let's say, uh, manufacturing and, and uh, retail and, and your, in your area, can you take us through like, the latest technologies or digital technologies or or digital strategies that you've been using? Uh, can you share some of your experience into this? Yes, yeah, sure. First of all, I think that I, I hope that you are well and thank you for the invitation. So I was now leading at, uh, at the poll that was launched. What is the top priority in digitalization? And I see that it's, it talks a lot about uh, automation and data. And uh, from what I've experienced, this journey from manufacturing side it started already five, six years ago. Uh, the first top idea is still not on how we transform our finance teams, but from a management perspective on simplifying and harmonizing the systems that we work with. So every day, uh, the number of data that we are receiving from our stakeholders is increasing and increasing. And the mistake that we used to make was to work with more tools that were not uh, integrated and coherent uh, one with the other ones. So the first big decision, the most improvement that I think we need to make is to choose one ERP system and one financial planning tool. And that's the uh, basis and that's where we started working from. And from here on, we started uh, simplifying and automatizing all the, all the processes, systems, and data that we could. So that we started uh, decreasing the number of days that we were taking to, clo to have a month in closing. We decreased and harmonized the number of trends that we were doing from on a, on, on a yearly basis. And uh, that all is helping to really harmonize with our CEOs on having real-time data to make the best decision possible, but having only one language. 
uh, and one way to look at the same data. And I think that this digitalization that is not a project, it's a, it's a change management. It all starts from here. And uh, this is the base that I would like to, to share uh, from my experience. And from then onwards is when we can take all our financial teams and develop their skills to what Migalis was uh, mentioning at the beginning on, on new hard skills that will come along and alongside this develop other soft skills you know, that uh, have not how to transform our, our uh, finance teams from data crunchers, from uh, hard skills on the back office yeah. into being uh, into the front office, business partnering with, with, with uh, our stakeholders. Yes, for sure. Data, data is there. It's sort of the main topic today, and we'll see it in, in the next sessions as well about data-driven insights. Also, I can't wait for the PwC presentation on that because digitalization and 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 putting into into finance is about intelligent uh, reporting or intelligent data-driven insights and and live and online and automated and and right to to the user for sure. Matthias. Um, uh, what about AI? I mean, uh, uh, if I recall, you have, uh, uh, no, with Novartis, you've been uh, collaborating with a university in Munich uh, into that. Can you tell us a bit on this story? Yeah, the, thanks, Herb. I mean, one of, of the elements to, to make a difference is obviously uh, learning how to use artificial intelligence. And I mean, uh, traditionally, we, we have had um, IT and, and software development in-house. But I think for artificial intelligence, it, it requires a new approach since it's a completely a different animal. Yeah, it's not a software you can just buy and, and uh, do, do plug and play. It, it's, it has a transformational element. And in order to, to use this properly, what worked for us is um, a cooperation with, uh, with Unternehmertum, which is the commercialization unit of, of Technical University in Munich. And here we started with a, with a workshop, the entire management team to learn what AI means, how it works, because for, for most colleagues, this is still difficult to grasp. And then we develop use cases. And um, there are many areas uh, with, um, with looking at processes, at the product services, business models, where potentially you could use it. But uh, I think it's important then to, to uh, bring the list down to a few um, numbers and uh, we, we prioritize them. And then it's also important you look at enabling factors in the organization, yeah? I mean, who should participate? You now need a new role of a chief um, artificial intelligence and data officer, a role which wow. didn't exist before. Yeah. And this person should uh, not uh, report somewhere down the line in IT. It should ideally report to the CEO or close to that. Uh, so it's not only to, about data privacy, it's about data intelligence, yeah? Uh, <laughs> Enough absolutely, with, uh, data privacy data protection. <laughs> is, is also important, in particular in Europe. Uh, but uh, that's pretty, uh, traditionally in, in, in legal, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you need to get people on board. I mean, let's also acknowledge people have fears, yeah, what artificial intelligence will do to their jobs. And you need to consider IT constraints, yeah, IT infrastructure. I never underestimate even also maintenance after the project has, has gone live. So there are many elements. Which, which require a new approach. And for us, it has proven very useful to, to have a partner or an ecosystem to learn and um, yeah, uh, kind of experiment on the way. You know, it's also evaluating these projects is very different. I mean, traditionally you have an NPV or an ROI calculation, but for, for AI, that's more like an, an R&D project yeah, where you kind of yeah. define milestones and then give the budget according to achievement. But at the beginning, it's hard to quantify. So perhaps I hope this gives you a couple of ideas how we approach it. Sorry? Yeah, perhaps let me pass it to Michalis because I'm, I'm interested to hear if Google is preparing something to, you know, like a new product we can use for AI, maybe we can download from, <laughs> from <laughs> Google. I mean, are you piloting something interesting, maybe in your yeah, yeah, yeah. internal yeah. operations that we could, like we can use later on. <laughs> well, I mean, there are definitely things which are already public, right? So, and I mean, the the private one, you know, the ones, the non-public ones, I don't even know them myself. So, uh, <laughs> the, the ones under R and D. But I would say, like, um, to build on Matthias' point on AI and machine learning, because this is super important. It's going to be super important for our jobs moving forwards. That. I think you know from our perspective because part of our products except like the eight like the ads piece a very big part of our products is it's actually selling digital transformation through the cloud platform right so because to be able for a company to achieve a digital transformation it has to be 
on a cloud-based, let's say, infrastructure rather than in the typical on-premises infrastructure to be able to achieve the scalability uh, of, the, of big transformation. So within the cloud environment, there are tools, uh, let's say, for example, that it, not only Google, but most of the tech companies have, like, you know, like the big queries or like, you know, some machine learning module or AI module we, or robotic process automations that many of the companies can use. Uh, and they're not like, super high tech or they need super high hard skills to do it but they are tailored in a way depending on your let's say proficiency to be able to use them and drive value not just from a finance perspective but overall from a from a total business perspective right because for example we use let's say the modeling the predictive modeling for ai and machine learning in finance but for example very importantly for matthias area where it's pharmaceuticals like a healthcare company or a healthcare institution could be able to predict with the right ai the next pandemic let's say or the time that when that may happen right so there are many important tools in there uh, which are uh, you know available to, across companies but it has to be on a cloud infrastructure base, so a digital, what we really call a digitally, digitally, digitally transformed company to be able to have the scalability and those, you know, aim on your hands to be able to deliver these results. Thank you, Mihalis. Thank you also to wrap it up. I mean, definitely digital transformation in the finance function, it is an opportunity for business growth. I mean, there are tools and technologies that can be utilized and should be utilized, I mean, to, to help uh, growing the, you know, the business strategy. Uh, for sure. Thank you all for your time. Thanks uh, for, for a great panel and, uh, and see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you as well. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. So, running... Can everyone see me? Okay, yeah. All right. So, so looking at the time and uh, and moving on really fast with our next uh, part of the agenda, uh, we have Christina Orfanidou if she can join. Oh, hi, Christina. Hello. Good, Good afternoon. Sorry, at PwC, and she will take us through into some more details about this data-driven business transformation. Uh, definitely, we we're just talking about this, Christina. You know the importance of data. Uh, for transforming the finance function. So uh, yes. the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I definitely I don't have to convince anyone about the data <laughs> transformation imperative. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, by the deputy minister before uh, how important uh, data strategy is uh, and how data is in the center of transformation. And it's also been discussed extensively by the panel. Uh, so. Um, um, what I'm here to do now is to share uh, some of my own experiences and insights uh, from working on helping organizations uh, transform and become data driven. And these um, experiences I will share are based on work that we are doing here in Cyprus, but also PwC experiences globally. So um, um, as I've already said, uh, everybody knows uh, how important data is uh, in the whole uh, business transformation uh, journey of an organization. And we now, uh, we are now experiencing the big data gold rush. So we are not only looking at internal data organizations, but we now have this big ocean of data available to us, external, that uh, organizations can leverage in order to improve the way they work. So uh, just some uh, quick numbers uh, to reflect better on this big data gold rush. Um, 1.7 megabytes of new information is created every second for every human being on the planet. And probably by the time I started saying this sentence, this number has already changed. Um, there are now more than 50 billion smart connected devices in the world, all developed to collect, analyze, and share data. And a third of this data now passes uh, through the cloud. And Michal has touched upon this in the previous panel, that this creates the opportunity for scalability of uh, data applications and machine learning applications. Um, the additional net income 
projected that will result from just a 10% increase in data accessibility for a typical Fortune 1000 company is estimated at $65 million. Uh, and also 50% of all business analytics software will in the near future incorporate prescriptive analytics built uh, on cognitive computing functionalities. So um, the world is, uh, is moving ahead in a very fast pace and the industries that are driving most of this uh, growth and are uh, enabling this proliferation of data are banking and financial services in general, manufacturing, uh, which Jean uh, mentioned before, government and uh, personal services. So the most important part of this transformation is not the data itself, but is the strong emergence of analytics that can now support uh, modern enterprises uh, to move from a process-centric viewpoint to a data-centric viewpoint. So uh, moving from merely using descriptive analytics to see what is going on into predictive modeling, smarter analysis, and into becoming what we call real-time enterprises. So that um, the real information is delivered to the right person at the right time. And obviously we all hear uh, the buzzwords and we, we hear about big data and AI and impressive models and impressive infrastructures. And um, this is obviously very important and predictive accuracy is very important for all of these to work. But it, um, the data-driven enterprise, unfortunately, it's still at its infancy. And the reason is because it is now being understood that the biggest challenge is not about having the most data or having the best tools or the best infrastructure. It's about um, being able to transform your organization's ability to use these insights and transform them into actions and outcomes. And this was also touched upon uh, in the panel just before. So it's not about having the tools and having the machine learning and AI, but it's how you interpret it. And this goes beyond uh, the technology. It becomes a business and people issue. So um, PwC's annual CEO survey, which uh, captures uh, the views of uh, thousands of C-suite leaders and executives globally, as they grapple with the uh, challenges that are facing their organizations, uh, show that the um, CEOs are sold on the power of data and analytics to deliver insights into key questions that they want to answer. They want to be data driven, but they acknowledge that there is a lot more to do. Two thirds, 61%, um, say that their own company's decision making is still uh, ma uh, mainly based on human judgment rather than machine algorithms. At the same time, 29% say that the companies already have predictive analytics capabilities. So they are shifting towards the right direction. So most companies are still on the cusp of change. They are aware of like all this power that analytics can offer, but they are still clinging to a status quo that relies on decision, a decision culture that is still based on, on intuition and experience. So what are these challenges that we have identified as holding back organizations? And we see this in our everyday working life. Uh, some of these challenges are the limited data science talent, uh, the complex data environments that sometimes include tools that are not so easy to use, the misalignment of analytics and business strategies. This is a very important point that we see also with the organizations we are helping. And uh, the deputy minister touched upon this. Um, data and technology in general are tools. Uh, they need to fulfill uh, a business uh, vision. So. The strategies need to be aligned. They are not two separate things. Um, the other one, other challenge faced is the lack of data-driven decision-making culture. That was also mentioned before, and on a technical level again, the lack of proper governance uh, processes within the organization. 
And in fact, um, it's very interesting because it looks like uh, the past year, or the current year, I should say, we are still on in 2020, it has been the year of the reality check for many organizations and for laying the groundwork for a more realistic data and AI powered future. So uh, PwC's AI prediction survey has showed that for 2020, only 4% of executives uh, had plans to deploy AI enterprise wide. The year before in 2019, that was 20%. So it actually went down. From uh, my own experience in uh, in my work in the data and AI lab in PwC and working with clients to develop analytics, AI, and automation strategies, uh, the the shift I, I can say that the shift comes from the realization of executives for the need to focus on fundamentals before enlarging analytics and more ambitious AI projects. Uh, so in the next few minutes, I will, I will describe to you what I believe are the priorities that organizations need to have so that they can take their organizations to the next step in their data transformation. So the first priority is to go back to boring stuff. What, what do I mean with this? Is that uh, to get serious return on investment from analytics and AI, it's better to start by deploying it in key in-house functions, and while at the same time laying the groundwork for a more exciting transformation to come in the future. So I believe that in the near future, a lot of the AI excitement will come from results that may sound quite uh, mundane, at the moment. So from incremental productivity gains of in-house processes. And indeed, in uh, PwC's AI prediction uh, survey, it looks like 44% of executives cited operating more efficiently and 42% cited increased productivity among the top three benefits expected from AI investments. So there is a realization that you need to start slow and in-house, and this is how you will lay the correct groundwork for the more exciting and ambitious endeavors in the future. So what is the best way to approach it? First and foremost, you need to be strategic. So you need to start by identifying the business needs and building the capabilities around them. The second is to get organized. So. Uh, the best way forward is to create a centralized oversight that covers the entire uh, chain of data analytics and automation within an organization. And this is something that can be achieved through uh, proper data governance mechanisms, for example. And last but not least is to set the metrics. So to create enterprise-wide KPIs that include uh, measures of efficiency, effectiveness, and disruption of existing business processes so that you can uh, know and assess uh, how this transformation is developing. So the second priority is to rethink upskilling. And I think uh, we can all admit that uh, upskilling is the mantra of the time now. We keep hearing about upskilling. But if we approach upskilling as just technical training for non-technical people, uh, then we are probably doing it wrong. The trick is uh, for the transformation of the people, for the transformation of the organization to become what we call citizen-led and multilingual. And what do I mean with that? So um, how to achieve this is to plan to offer opportunities to uh, your staff and not just simply train them. True upskilling requires more than technical training. Uh, we can see also from the PwC survey that 50% of respondents recognize that uh, to truly upskill your staff and create the right culture, you need to give them immediate opportunities and incentives to apply these skills um, in the best way so that they develop their skills and also see the result of this uh, change. And by doing this in an applied way, it will also help create within your organization a digital data and AI-enabled mindset, and thus create this citizen-led culture 
that will focus on lifelong learning and cross-functional ways of working and solving problems. And this uh, last word I use, the cross-functional, is what I also mean when I say set a multilingual target. Companies require cross-skilling. So we need specialists in one area, for example, the data scientist, to also have enough basic skills in other areas, such as the business, so that they can speak each other's language. This cross-skilling is critical, not just to solve the data-related challenges, but also for the data scientists to be able to identify themselves which problems data and AI can solve within our organization. The third priority is uh, the issue of integrating analytics and AI into an organization's operation. To get true benefits of data and AI, business leaders need to put analytics and AI to work 24-7 as part of operational systems that work across functions and business units. AI in particular does not work in silos when it's isolated from other technologies. And um, mostly because AI needs data and the more good quality data AI gets from various sources, uh, the more power it gets and the more effective the results are. And secondly, some of AI's most valuable uses come when it works 24-7 as part of a broader operational system. For example, within finance, as we discussed before, or within marketing. And indeed, if we see um, what CEOs consider to be their biggest data-related issues in their organizations, or what they have been for 2020, they are all related to integration. None are related to technologies um, or accuracy. They are all related to integration. So identifying, collecting, or aggregating data across the organization, integrating AI and analytics to get business insight, or integrating data from IoT so that it can be used for AI. And my tips for how to do it is Firstly, to embed analytics and AI into your overall IT stack. That means incorporate the relevant models that are responsible for automation or key decisions into production systems that you already have in your organization. The second is to develop what we call machine learning operations, which combines expertise in data science with software engineering and IT operations. And last but not least, very important, is to make your data trustworthy. So to become data and AI enabled, you need data that is not just accurate, but that is also standardized, labeled, complete, free of bias, and compliant with uh, regulations and security standards. The last priority is reinventing your business model. So if your business is currently built only on uh, human and physical assets, you need a new model that integrates data as well as possibly AI's cognitive assets, if this is relevant. And that uh, works in AI time. So getting the technology right is definitely not simple. And I know that because I am an, a person that works on developing AI. So um, it's hard. But actually, that's the easy part. The top challenges that CEOs recognize um, around developing their data and AI capabilities are around business and around people. So measuring return on investment, getting a budget approved, training current employees to use AI, and making the business case. And indeed, these are challenges that we have seen that are being faced on a daily basis by organizations that want to take the next step forward. So uh, to achieve this uh, rethinking and reinvention of your business model, my tips are that first revisit the business model, evaluate what is the consumer value being generated by these new technologies and determine how you want to share, use, or invest in new value. 
The second is to monetize cognitive assets. You will have data assets and cognitive assets that are relevant to your industry and that you might be able to monetize. And lastly, make your strategy work in AI time. And what this means is that because the technology changes are so rapid and the emerging tech uh, is also so groundbreaking, the traditional annual planning cycles and biannual strategy refreshes are no longer enough. So the speed uh, of strategy has to change. And, um, uh, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> So I think you're coming uh, to an end, so that's why. Yes, I'm coming to an end. Yes, yeah. I'm coming to an end, but you surprised me a little bit. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Anyway, sure. so I'm coming to an end. Um, and I just uh, wanted to finish by saying that the data transformation imperative is clearly understood. We've been discussing it since the beginning of this webinar. But the real challenge of organizations will be to identify what are the needs and what are the projects that will justify the investment? And in, what, in whichever part of your journey you are as an organization, um, it is evident that now you must work to transform data into intelligence more consistently and that your success will depend not only on your systems, but also in your processes and most importantly, in your people. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Uh, definitely. I mean, coming a data-driven organization. I mean, this is you know from your last slide into what you've just mentioned. Uh, uh, it's great to have experts that are actually looking into AI and all this to to help businesses to implement all of this. Uh, I mean, tools and technologies and, and innovations because uh, it's it's easy to say, but not as easy to you know. Uh, get it done sometimes. Uh, let me take to a question that we have from the audience. Um, Victor Ephthimiadis is asking, I think that one of the reasons that businesses are reluctant to implement AI is the lack of skills. So, I mean, definitely AI sounds for some, for some people something, you know, very uh, deep technical, something very, you know, hard to get or, or something that maybe only Google works at, you know. But uh, is there some initiative from PwC? I mean, how do we educate all these finance leaders? How do you simplify it for them, get, get them down to, you know, the, the, the baby steps? Yeah, uh, so um, I believe that uh, things are now changing. There is a shift in, um, in getting new uh, data science, data scientists. For example, in PwC, we are already a group of 15 data scientists that uh, work on uh, machine learning and analytics applications. Uh, but um, definitely uh, any organization can upskill. So we perform a lot of upskilling activities uh, to help our clients get up to date uh, with the skills and the tools that they need to know, but also uh, with the change management and the culture they have to develop internally in order to be able to do it themselves. Um, so um, I think there is now opportunity to get help uh, from experts in Cyprus also. And um, it, it's usually a good idea to have someone external kickstart your AI journey and then uh, join them along the way in uh, learning the skills and implementing them in your own organization. So perhaps starting with the hotline, calling PwC and saying, I need AI, yes. please, please let's arrange an, an, an intro, <laughs> yeah? Yes, call me, <laughs> yes, All right. definitely. Thank you, Christina, thanks for your time, Thank great you presentation. Um, so Thank you. Um, conscious on time, I'm moving on into the next topic, which is actually uh, my presentation and, and thanks, Cube, thanks, uh, Ikpak for the opportunity to also um, uh, talk a bit about my experience, talk a bit about how is RCB Bank actually looking into uh, this area of digital transformation and, and, and not necessarily from the inside, but actually from uh, the, the external side of helping our business clients to go all in digital, to, to transform. I mean, obviously we see the market transforming uh, obviously, there is a lot of 
digital transformation in, in many areas, uh, uh, in all industries, whether it's serving your clients or whether it's uh, your internal uh, uh, financial controlling and, and, and the data uh, reporting and all these automations in, uh, on your processes. Uh, so what is the digital adoption in finance? I mean, what are some of the new channels or new experience that we are working here in, in RCB? And, uh, and, and trying to, to, to help our clients for. Um, definitely it's all here. I mean, how we moved from transformation to adoption because we've, we've seen online shopping and, and, and one of the things that, you know, okay, it's there, uh, it's been there for a while, but how is that evolving uh, as well as the omnichannels or this data-driven innovation and, and all these uh, uh, new generations that, um, are uh, doing everything on their mobile these days. Um, so, um, uh, while the market is driven by merchant businesses, definitely while, while the consumers are depending on what their um, uh, retailers or what their shops or what their, you know, uh, the, the merchants, whether it's hospitality on food and beverage or, or whatever the industry, uh, those are the ones that are actually setting up the stage, influencing the consumer demands. Um, and we see that because uh, as much as a consumer wants to be using the digital uh, means of uh, whether it's a, you know, a digital wallet or some, uh, let's say, uh, digital um, uh, card or or something that he wants to use to pay or to or or a mobile and a, and a laptop to make a purchase online. Uh, it all also boils down to what the market will offer them to use, uh, right? And uh, our role here and what we're trying in our strategy uh, and uh, uh, after actually 25 years being here in Cyprus and 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 expanding in the local market as well as as well as in Europe. We're looking into empowering our merchant clients. We're looking into expanding with our business clients to, to set the stage and improve the digital customer experience. And this is, you know, it's been it's been part of our priorities and it's been part of our, our main key pillars in our strategy lately. Uh, of course we're looking in the inside as well of how we digitalize our internal workflows, our onboarding processes, our our own data-driven insights and reporting processes. But definitely, uh, we're working closely with these market drivers. We're working closely with our clients uh, because we want to understand their business and we want to adjust with them or we want to help them provide new channels, provide new experience and transform their business themselves. And, and this is uh, very important to us. Um, having said that, we're not looking only into the digital economy because yes, definitely we're all moving into digital. Digital is here uh, with all the AI machine learning, with all this innovation, and we will also hear a, a great presentation from Mastercard later today about what the future is holding from us. Um, I believe from digital, we're also moving into the experience economy. And, and according to the World Economic Forum, I've been reading that it is booming. And actually, more than 70% of uh, consumers are looking more into paying for an experience rather than uh, a tangible, tangible things. And, and really, there's rapid advancements in the technology that are actually enabling companies to create memorable and, and personalized experience. Uh, uh, funny enough, in the picture, I don't know if anyone, uh, and I don't think anyone would recognize, but this is actually me in the photo doing skydiving in a tube about a year ago in Israel. So definitely an experience and definitely something that I had to use several digital means. Uh, for example, taking Uber to, to go to this place, uh, using my digital wallets to make a payment, going into some digital, I mean, I, I did, I used online booking to, uh, to, to go to this place. And then technology was the enabler to, to help me live this experience. Um, I was strongly recommended, by the way. <laughs> uh, so what have we been working on? I mean, really, the RCB success in digital products. 
Uh, we've set up our own in-house processing center and we've focused on complete and enhanced solutions for accepting cards and digital payments. Uh, at least for the financial services, um, digital payments uh, and, and digital banking is the way to go. I mean, this is what consumers need. And this is, um, uh, like someone said, moving into a cashless society, it's, it's, it's what we are. Um, for whom? I mean, our focus is on clients and these merchants that they really want to grow. I mean, we want to sit next to them as partners and, and provide improved customer experience. We want to help them improve their own uh, selling uh, processes. Uh, their own uh, uh, finance operations or their own reporting uh, reconciliations and all that. And, and really, I mean, it's been a pleasure uh, working with the CFOs of, of, of our clients. Um, uh, why, why it's important? I mean, it's important as a universal, uh, you know, as a one-stop shop uh, to, uh, to provide several types of products and services along this uh, uh, package, let's say, along this uh, uh, servicing uh, of our clients. And uh, the way to go, I mean, talking about digital transformation of our, your clients uh, is about offering tailor-made solutions. I mean, providing simplicity uh, into their operations, providing personalized experience and transparency. Uh, if I need to name a few examples of our progress, I mean, we've done our digital wallets, the Apple Pay experience. Uh, we've put out in the market the latest technology in post terminals that will keep updating and upgrading what's there to ensure that uh, we're up to speed and offering the, the latest and more advanced uh, solutions, um, including e-commerce through our RCB payment gateway, uh, all the way up to paying contactless uh, using your wallets or cards at, at a parking station, uh, and and so on, and and we're and there's more and more like automating uh, loyalty program offerings uh, with seamless, uh, uh, let's say, cashback uh, rewards uh, without having, for example, the cashier to ask uh, for for your phone number or to ask whether your uh, you are a member for for of the loyalty program and all these, uh, uh, let's say, uh, everyday uh, complications. Uh, now, what are the new channels and new experience? I mean, lately, really, we've been uh, focusing on improving all these uh, standard uh, channels. So, uh, one example is uh, uh, taking payments through email or SMS. I mean, definitely. Uh, for industries like hospitality with, with hotels, but uh, as well as uh, utility bill providers, uh, we've put together services and, and products that are actually uh, offering simplicity in the market, where you can receive a link through an SMS uh, to uh, uh, conduct your, your payment and pay your bill. Uh, uh, and actually, it's been it's been quite popular now with the uh, pandemic as well. Uh, bulk online payment transfers and open APIs. Uh, it's been very interesting how this past year we've been actually helping our clients transform from checks to to bulk online payment transfers, uh, and also some clients, some major corporate clients that were actually. Uh, having their systems and their platforms connected to the bank's APIs so that they can receive online and real-time uh, information from their statements, their balances, or conduct their payments directly from their systems. So, so we're not looking into just having a state-of-the-art internet banking or mobile banking for, for customers to log in, but how they can do all that from their own systems. Uh, and I can go on and on with this, like simplifying their their uh, their reconciliation processes, their reporting, uh, offering tools and solutions, uh, integrating with their point of sales, and so on. Um, already mentioned about the e-government login that we've uh, uh, helped with uh, Ariadne, uh, as well as tokenization, as well as uh, uh, cash at post service that we've recently launched. 
in an effort to simplify and offer convenience to the consumer uh, without needing to basically withdraw cash without needing to go to ATMs. Um, being conscious on time, I want to end by saying that our goal here and our effort is to change the culture and approach. We're, we're looking into digitalizing our own clients. We're looking to offer value. We're looking to, to work as, as a partner, not just do things for them, but do things with them. So doing with is, is important and not only help them save money, so offering low cost services, but making sure that what they are investing on, they're well spent. Uh, and definitely, I mean, it's it's not only about using technologies, it's not only about, you know, digital transformation, it's not only about um, uh, finding the right tool and, uh, and service or product, but uh, definitely um, uh, what tools you should be investing on. Um, so, uh, key things to summarize, uh, business customers is our focus, a new approach, working as partners and offering new experience. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I guess I need to pass it on to the next, uh, I don't know if there's any questions before I pass it on. Um, I don't see, or is there something? Hi, George, thanks for joining. Hi, hi, hi. And uh, if we were uh, at the hotel now, this would have been the time for a coffee break, I think. But <laughs> yes, for sure. Please for stay sure. with us. Please stay with us. <laughs> um, yeah. I see in the audience, oh, coffee, I have, yes. I have uh, there are people, um, there are CFOs there that uh, we went to the same high school. So uh, take a stretch break. <laughs> they know this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, stay with us because we have uh, interesting things to say. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Thomas Medzen from Germany. Uh, he's the CFO of uh, SGS in Germany. And I would also would like to welcome uh, Lupus Zitka from, uh, he's the Citibank Europe uh, for Czechoslovakia. Czech and Slovakia, not Czechoslovakia, used to be one. Hi, guys. Hey, hey, Georgi. I just want to start this discussion by asking first Lubos, uh, uh, a strong believer in the business and purpose-oriented finance function, to share his thoughts on the new roles of finance. Okay, thank you very much, George, for, for this opportunity to kind of have some speech before such a great audience. I think that like technical details, these were mostly covered by other speakers. But what, what I see as a crucial, and this was also kind of one of my topics, we will see if there will be time to cover that. I think that the, the key question for the future, and this relates also to the new role, is the one and whether, whether and if finance kind of should be the product owner of its own deliverables or it should be follower as up till now. In my beliefs and in my new world, I would say, I think that finance, finance people should be fully responsible for marketing of their product and for making sure that there is a client who is willing to buy this product. Unlike in past, when, when, when we all could see kind of not robocops, but cops running around the company and kind of checking on the people, producing some reports, value of which could be disputed. I think that the, the biggest the biggest shift for the future is kind of privatization of finance as such. Because with all that technology, it will be very much visible how the data is gathered. It should be online. So it will be no problem. It will be no problem to have the data. But the question will be, do we have the right people to kind of uh, interpret the data and really dig the value out of out of the data? This is this is the key question. And I don't believe that today we have these people. And as PwC said very correctly, I think that uh, it, it is this this change. This is not question of technology and tools. 
because believe me, I think that today the majority of companies has already sufficient tools to make the decisions correctly. But the question is, are we are we so mature and are we so professional that we are able to make to make these decisions independently and own these decisions? I'm not so persuaded about it because this will require change in the mindset and really owning the finance function as such and shifting from the passive producer of the data to kind of, uh, I would say, like interpreter of the data and storyteller. As for the change in the function, I think that we will be in a very, very near future, we will be able to see that the traditional jobs as kind of typical accountants or kind of controllers, these will disappear. And I think that there will be very, very new requirements for the finance role I see as a crucial kind of IT, IT skills definitely, but these, these would be more relevant for, I would say, not so senior finance stuff. For senior finance stuff as we have in audience, I think that the crucial shift will be towards business skilling. And I mean, like everybody is talking about business partnership. I think that is nice, that, that is nice. And it means in a traditional, when traditionally speaking, it means that as a finance, we would like to be seen as someone who is kind of here for, for business whenever they need something. But in my point of view, I think that it is, it is kind of far more, it is, it is more detailed, more granular, and we, we, should be, we should be part of the business, not the partner, but really be one of the business people within the company. Because the future will show us that our finance function will we'll have to be kind of uh, reliable on trust and trust will be only created whenever we will be able to deliver the product based on the requirements of the business. So not being advisor, not being partner, but be w one of them. That's the future, I think. Georgie, you are on mute. Georgie, we can see you. <laughs> George, hi, you're George. Sorry, sorry. I, I switched into the. Uh, now you can hear me. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I was introducing Thomas. Uh, I was saying uh, <laughs> that he's a famous uh, former referee. I've checked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his bio in, in Wikipedia. I don't have one. Thomas has <laughs> one. So you are more famous than uh, than I am. Uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Lucas already talked about the the change, but there are times that there is resilient to change. People refuse to change. Uh, uh, what do you do? What do you suggest if this is the case that the employees or clients don't want things to change? Well, the, the first question that you have to get is, do you have a valid strategy for your change and for your transformation? And who are the stakeholders to buy in? Um, of course, new impulses, whatever you do for, uh, you don't have automatically a follower. Uh, the audience has to be convinced. There are fears, there are misinterpretations in the history as well. For instance, like Picasso who said, computers are senseless, or uh, the Microsoft boss, Steve Ballmer, who said these jobs uh, iPhones will never uh, be the future. They are too expensive. They have keypads. They are not used as mailing machines, and so on. So, of course, if you believe in this change, then you have to be really inspiring. Walk around and make advertisements for your new ideas and changes. And then, of course, you have to convince. And this kind of uh, self-selling story. Financial guys are not the best promoters and salespeople. So therefore, create a kind of, of openness and, and manage the, the expectations and this kind of, of communications. You don't have to be a big entrepreneur and running around with new ideas every day, but as a leader uh, of a department, and this is the new role from my understanding as CFO, as, as already many of the colleagues in, uh, in before have, have mentioned it, you have to promote the change and really address the added value. Uh, 
So it is a difficult political issue as well if you're not really 100% accepted from the business. So you have to get uh, commitment from the business side as well. And of course, your, your people in the team have to change what uh, already Lubus has, has said before. You need, per, you need really a, a dedicated team who is strong in communication and is strong as well in partnering. So um, despite the technical solution, what you have, you need then also the promotion by yourself. And on the, on the third hand side, you need a team that is delivering. Do you think that this current pandemic crisis uh, help people to endorse changes? Absolutely. From my point of view, I believe that the entire situation about uh, flexibility, home office, uh, yeah. and granting freedom to a, to a dedicated person who can manage to live with this yeah. uh, is absolutely a, a sign of trust. Of course, many people, especially uh traditional accountants as we know them all um they are not so they are super careful they are more introverted they are not the character who are going around and pushing transformation in these yeah. times um and there is oftentimes the, the mismatch from a person i have this experience by myself who is more driven more going for things who has a huge volition um then you need a trans uh, transmitter in between a person who translates your expectation to your dedicated traditional con controllers or accountants and then you of course uh they get somehow involved in the decision making process and, and afterwards convinced um and as already said i strongly believe and i would already go further than uh, than christina has said it before I strongly believe that the that part of the IT department in the traditional sense what we have right now will be integrated into finance and will be part of finance in the future because finance is so cl closely linked with all these new ideas and transactions um, that IT is an elementary pillar of the new strategy of finance itself. Uh, with all the digital dashboards in Power BI, in VWs and uh, uh, performance apps like utilization of laboratories, cash monitoring, sales pipeline tracking, and so on, you name it. So these kind of ideas get pushed and initiated by finance. So the position of finance becomes more and more managerial uh, and more important for my understanding. So, and if you are part of this entire change process, then of course you have absolutely a self motivation by your own that it's despite the pandem pandemic, pandemic situation you can deal with. And uh, you don't have to be afraid about controls and working not enough and so on and so on. In finance, you can 100% count on your team, or you see already the, the errors and mistakes somehow uh, occurring in, in another situation and then you have to select the right people from the wrong ones thank you thomas here in the eastern mediterranean when we say security we mean a lot more than data security but uh, i would uh, like to hear from lupus uh, uh, what, what he thinks about the data security and what are the regular regulatory issues that come uh, that Okay, Th thank you for the question, George. I think that th this comes this comes hand to hand with kind of using of the new technology, like using of the new technology as, as a phenomenon really imposes on all of us new requirements when it comes to legal and compliance kind of necessities which are to be followed. For us being kind of uh, one of the biggest houses in the regula in the regulated banking industry, this this is kind of I would say really topic number one right now because we we are fully aware we are fully aware that without having without having our data properly structured and managed from both compliance and legal point of view because kind of uh, we have we have a huge data warehouses which which consist also like private private data and this this is strictly followed by the regulators so i would say that this is really crucial for any strategy so my, my practical advice would be really kind of invite from the very beginning of any transformation change project, invite the subject matter experts for data. The question is if, if, you, if you have them in house, I think that in many cases you will have to pay for this expertise because it's highly specialized and 
kind of usually the, the company itself does not have so many projects that the experts could leverage on the experience. But I think that this is really crucial when it comes for kind of compliance changes for us, AML, text, text transformation. I mean, I, I would not estimate it at all. I think, I mean, if, to be honest, I would not start the project without having these subject matter experts because you can fabulate kind of marvelous, marvelous structure, marvelous project plan. However, if you do not, if you do not value this, this type, this type of the problem, you can easily end up in a black hole and all the efforts and the, and the kind of trust, trust of your partners who are working on the project will be lost very easily. So ne never estimate the kind of the data security, data structuring and flow of the data within within your processes. I think that this this is a crucial milestone of any mm. of any kind of transformation change to start with your data, to start with the processes because as our our dear friend from the Cyprus government told us, data are the e crucial asset. I definitely agree and I would add on top of that as any other tangible or intangible asset it's your responsibility to treat the, to treat them with a due diligence and a due care as a as a proper owner. This is yeah. this is my message. Thank you, Lubos. Thomas, uh, last question for you. Uh, here in Cyprus, we always feel a bit far from Europe. So I'm asking you, what are the trends now within the European Union? Is it time to outsource back office uh, functionalities? Well, from, from the current situation, there was a, a big initiative to outsource many things to Central Eastern European countries due to the uh, salary level. But uh, many of the of the competitors and uh, from my experience, they have already changed because uh, if you locate all this kind of shared service centers in a dedicated place, uh, the salary level is, is competing to each other and it is uh, jumping up in, uh, quite rapidly. More than this, there are technical issues, as Lubos had mentioned, uh, from a data security point of view, uh, to transfer this kind of, of audits and tax compliance issues somewhere abroad is not oftentimes that easy. So what I believe is instead of outsourcing things, try to make it in-house, automate it, make it more digitalized, make the single point of truth in your own responsibility close to you, uh, and then you have a more powerful organization, then send it somewhere abroad and then you don't see it and you cannot manage it anymore due to the distance already. Okay. Guys, I would like to thank you very much uh, for either participating in this discussion. Uh, I think uh, I've learned a few things. I hope the audience also has learned a few things as well. And uh, since there is a pressure on time, and I see Harik yes. is there, which means that there is pressure on time, we will we'll need to move to, the, you, next, uh, to the next panel, then data-driven insights. Thanks to all of you. If you're, I would appreciate to answer Thank your questions. Much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Let's welcome the next panel on on stage. And uh, and George, you may you may start with the next yeah. panelist uh, right you, away. Thank uh, you. As I've said, in the meantime, just to. Insights. Uh, yes. we'll have the pleasure time, let, me, let me remind the audience about the polls, if they can answer the polls, perhaps in the next uh, transition we can go through uh, the answers of the polls. Okay, uh, Lenka is here, Paolo, I'll leave it up to you. Hi guys, uh, it's Lenka Holatul from uh, Walmart and Paolo Paolino, CFO, Director for NVIDIA. Uh, hi guys, it's a pleasure to have you in, the, in, in this panel. Uh, I'm starting with you, Lenka. Uh, you're responsible for the company strategy. Uh, what we can learn from your experience in Walmart? Hello from Czech Republic. So what I would like to share with you today and what we already discussed several times is to how to get um, um, good employees and the proper uh, team members uh, with uh, such a difficult time as we are right now and also with the time when we have so many changes and we implement so many technologies and want to be efficient as possible. Yeah. So, uh, 
we had a similar problem. Yeah, we uh, at the beginning we was uh, at Walmart. We was most of the time like Excel company, and we wanted to, to change. So we implement so much new technology and uh, to support other teams. We realized that we are missing a proper and uh, good people in our team with uh, good technical skills and uh, we need to hire some someone new yeah but unfortunately uh, for especially for my team i had a limited budget so let's talk about how to get a proper person with good technical skills with a limited budget yeah this might happen for you so uh, what we did that uh, we implement a, a new development program uh, for our uh, team members and so uh, we hired a junior person with a limited experience in analysis and um, in uh, in uh, controlling stuff we offered uh, it was a, 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 a she candidate uh, so we offered her a job under a severed conditions First of all, uh, that she need to attend to our development program, and we paid her a licensed training even before she's starting to work for us as a company and as a team member, uh, which was completely a different strategy for us. Yeah. So with this development program, we decided with a minimum four hours a week, we will dedicate for additional training. Yeah. So we uh, had a part of this uh, hours uh, special minimum two hours for the technical training for hard skills like uh, um, programming uh, uh, power bi uh, licenses sql understanding how to build the databases and so on then we had a part when we uh, mentor by examples uh, which means like because every company has some uh, principles, some quality uh, of the reports and um, uh, some culture. Yeah. So if uh, your team needs to um, you know, needs to provide some reports for your ceo or for you uh, uh, as a cfo you need to be sure that you are getting a good quality report uh, with additional value not just the numbers yeah so this was the mentoring um focused on by these examples to have a perfect uh, data report uh with uh, with a good visualizations and with good quality and also with some additional value to understand what is behind the data. And then we had a third step when we mentor, uh, mentored regarding uh, on the analysis and the strategy, even um, more understanding um, uh to to uh, how to uh, gain uh, the um, how how to gain uh, additional values from the data and transforming into the new opportunities yeah so not just the understanding of uh, how to work with the data and to have a uh, hard hard skills um uh to to work with the new technology but also the understanding the business when we uh, thought about um if we should hire a junior candidate for such a um for us such a important position um, we decided uh, that if we would hire a senior uh, person we would need to have a profile which basically we wasn't able to find anyone with the proper profile yeah so we would need to hire a several people uh, for doing uh, one one uh, uh, job position okay yeah. Uh, in, this is interesting, Lenka, and from that I will go to Paolo because uh, he's an experienced uh, senior finance leader for more than 15 years, 10 years plus in Microsoft. Hi, Paolo, and there is a never ending discussion here about uh, where companies uh, should invest uh, technology or people, and uh, I would like your advice on that. Yeah, no, thanks for the question and uh, hi everyone. So it's a very good question, right? So uh, I've been working for technology companies for the last 15 years, Microsoft first and now NVIDIA. 
And if you ask me whether uh, anyone should invest in technology, my answer, of course, is yes. Right. So I think if you don't do that, so um, you are missing out. Right. So yeah. you won't get very far. And I, I think it's that's that's pretty clear to everyone in, uh, in this webinar today. Um, with that said, um, investing in technology per se um, is not enough. Right. You also need to invest in in people, which doesn't mean, in my opinion. Uh, hiring new people, right? Uh, but perhaps also developing uh, your your existing people. So I'll give you some examples, right? Um, when you think about implementing new technology, especially in finance, um, the first thing that uh, that you're going to do most likely is automation, right? So yes. You're going to automate uh, the, the way you do things uh, because simply what, whenever you ask a finance person, can you do this, can you do this differently, they will, they will tell you, no, I cannot because I don't have the time, I don't have the bandwidth to do it. So the, the really first strategy is to automate um, the tools that you have to move from Excel-based tools to more intelligent, I will say, systems. Uh, so you free up time. So how do you utilize the time of people, right? Uh, and I think you need to expose them to new technology. And that's, that's absolutely uh, important to develop talent within the organization. Um, for, for us as, a, as a leaders of, in finance, but also for the individuals. So I think that there are 130 people now in, in this webinar. And uh, if you don't invest in yourself learning the new technology, most likely you're not going to have the same opportunities in the future of somebody that has been actually investing in technology, right? Usually when Cypriot companies invest in technology and free up time, they cut jobs. And uh, I don't know what, what's going on elsewhere, but usually well, they invest in order to... Do uh, well, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be so, um, you know, direct with the message, right? So I, I, I truly believe that, especially in finance, um, implementing like a, an AI system, for example, it doesn't mean per se that you are gonna you are gonna fire people. I think you will need people to do a different type of job. That's what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's our responsibilities as finance leaders also to think about that. Uh, it's not that straightforward, in my opinion. The same person can actually do a different, a different uh, role. For example, um, there are all these uh, natural language processing tools that can be applied to accounting or yeah. audit. Um, so the auditors won't, won't need to go through like millions of documents. Won't re need to read millions of documents because there will be an AI in the back doing that for him. But the auditor can actually validate the results and add value on the on the, the knowledge. Same with uh, predictive analytics, right? There will be a, there will be machines. There are machines today that, that they will do some sort of forecasting for us. But in the end, the machine doesn't have the business sense, the, the business touch, the business acumen that we as a finance leader have. So your role is still extremely relevant. But in a different, you're gonna play a different game. Let's put it. Okay, Lenka, what are the practices uh, these days? What are the tools that our companies are using now, uh, especially when we are talking about the internal IT strategy? Yes. So, as I said, originally we was an Excel company. We transform and automize quite a lot. Uh, but so right now our uh, purpose is to um, little bit forced all of our employees and colleagues uh, to use uh, more advanced technology. So with the idea that we had a certain cluster with eight different ERPs and the, ten different CRMs. It, it was very difficult to consolidate and work uh, with as a one unified architecture because we didn't have that yet. So what we did that we developed um, uh, API pumps from each our ERPs and CRM systems, and we are pumping on daily basis our all the, our data in one SQL database and using the Power BI reports and automized visualization tools. We are uh, basically 
uh, doing all the reports and all the consolidation in the Power BI currently. Uh, what is great, the um, uh, this this approach was supported by our uh, group CEO. So basically, what happened that even he uh, was using these automated reports on um, on uh, presentations uh, on daily basis, which was forced to. to other colleagues to use these automated reports uh, uh, as well. So we increased our training regarding the regarding the BI tools. And what happened that uh, um, in a very short time, in like uh, weeks, uh, let's say half of the company transformed from the Excel to BI tools and started to work with the automated reports in BI, even for the ad hoc reports. Yeah, it was a huge transformation for us, and everything start with the changing uh, the um, basically the culture in our company. Yeah, thank you, Lenka. Paolo, one uh, last question for you. Sure. Um, it's about the risk, the security, and the privacy of the data. We had the same discussion on the previous panel. And I want your thoughts on this. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do agree with what has been says, said already, right? Um, what, what I see um, is that um, a lot of American, American companies, right, they are building data centers uh, locally, right, to, to actually answer uh, this this kind of need of security, right? So what I've experienced in my in in, in my career so far, uh, there is this tendency not to trust data center, especially when the data center is located in a in another country. Um, so I think that the, the big corporations are really putting an effort there to invest locally. If you think about your region um, lately, I think Microsoft announced a big investment in, in Greece. That's that's the last one. But uh, you could mention, you know, with any company out there, um, there are this kind of uh, initiatives happening. If you ask me, uh, I would trust more a data center than uh, than uh, than my machine in terms of data security, right? Because my my PC could be stolen anytime or my hard drive could, could break any time. So if the data is stored somewhere else, I think that we have uh, enough security systems. I'm not an expert there, but uh, uh, as a finance guy, I will trust more a data center than, uh, than other solutions. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Lenka, for sharing your experience and your thoughts uh, with us. Uh, I have to give the, I have to give the Harris Xenofondos the, the right <laughs> now to continue. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Have a great fortunately or, or not, we are on a tight schedule, but it's definitely even those few minutes that uh, that everyone has. I mean, are, are really important to pass on their their key messages, and uh, and and that's what makes this you know webinar so great. Uh, and and we have some flow going. Uh, I see Nicoletta on stage. Hi, Nicoletta. Nicoletta Psilidou is a senior manager in PwC advisory. And I see also Fivos Leon Diu just join as well. Um, and Vasilios Brahimis. Hi, everyone. Hi, Harry. Hi, hi. So are you having fun so far? Of course, yes. Excellent, excellent. Ready to provide also your own insights on, on the perspectives, uh, on the practical challenges, basically, that uh, we have on, on digital transformation, correct? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, all right, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So good afternoon to all of you and welcome to our panel discussion. Um, as Harry has already introduced me, uh, I'm a senior manager at PwC's advisory department. And it's a great pleasure both to be participating in this event and to be moderating the panel with our guests. Our topic this afternoon is sharing perspectives on the practical challenges of transformation. And we'll be hearing perspectives on the transformation experience of two distinct organizations, as well as the way the two organizations have collaborated in their transformation efforts. 
So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to our panel guests. Fivos is the Chief Operating Officer at Hellenic Bank in Cyprus, and Vasilis is a partner in charge of banking and health industries and the head of technology and transformation. Hi from me as well. Hi, Fivo. Hi, Vasily. Um, and, and to kick off the, the discussion, I will invite uh, Fivos first to give us his thoughts. Um, Fivo, could you please tell us more about Hellenic Bank's transformation journey, its goals, the setup, and any challenges, successes you've had? Okay, thank you, Nicoletta, and thank you to the organizers and the sponsors for giving us this opportunity. Basically, uh, just to share some experiences in terms of our transformation planning and uh, uh, governance in the few minutes that we have. And uh, always, it has been said by various speakers today, always the focus is the customer. Also, part of the focus is the internal efficiencies, uh, be it the automation, streamlining, centralization, etc. because uh, both uh, the alignment of the customer and internal efficiencies obviously translate to the results of the bank eventually. Now, on the, on the planning and uh, how do we arrive at the planning of the transformation, obviously this is part of the whole planning cycle of the bank that it's revisited uh, annually and monitored at uh, even monthly or quarterly intervals during the year. It starts from the risk appetite statement of the bank. The strategy derives from there. Part of the strategy is obviously a major enabler, enabler is uh, transformation. Transformation uh, then translates into the end strategy in more general, translates to a number of, of initiatives. We call it the operational plan of the, of the bank. And uh, three of the key initiatives of the uh, operational plan are uh, the transformation ones, the main ones, which are the, for our case, is the evolution of our branches on the one side, on the, of the, our digital channels on the other, and of our loan processes in order, obviously, to achieve the customer uh, alignment and the internal efficiencies as previously discussed. Supporting the three main transformation initiatives are uh, various other initiatives, obviously, of transformational nature, which could relate to the migration of customers to the digital channels. They may relate to data analytics, a lot of the topics discussed today, and, and various other initiatives as well. Uh, this is regards the, uh, the planning. Going to the governance, because I think to make transformation successful eventually, you need to have good governance about it. There is certain principles that we follow to start with, and one has to do with the detailed planning. Second has to do with swift decision making, and you, I'll tell you in a minute how we operate in terms of committees, etc. Third one has to do with dedicated resources. And a fourth parameter is, uh, is the, and sometimes you have to impose deadlines. And uh, we find that sometimes in imposing deadlines, we get uh, better results. Now, committees, uh, there is in terms of committees and other governance, the practical implementation of the governance. One, there is working teams obviously with dedicated resources. There is for each of the programs that I have previously mentioned of the transformation, we have a steering committee. We have an executive transformation committee, which uh, involves the key executives of the bank, including the CEO. We have even a board transformation committee, and uh, this highlights the alignment of our board as well. And obviously, we involve the board of directors with frequent reporting or frequent presentations, etc. There is associated KPIs that we follow, and uh, we see the progress of the transformation plan. As, as said, this is a holistic uh, approach to transformation, and uh, we have done also with the uh, collaboration with PwC, our transformation office has done an, an overall transformation plan, an overarching transformation plan, through which we managed to record all the initiatives there. We were monitoring them on, online, and we have managed to see the gaps, interdependencies, etc. But I will leave uh, Vasilis to say more about that. This is as far as uh, how we work on the transformation in terms of planning and governance. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Fivo. Um, Vasily, uh, could I ask the same question to you to share your perspective of transformation within uh, PwC? Yes. Um, thank you, Nicoletta. Um, as you know, actually, I'm currently going through my own personal annual transformation every November. So the mustache and the t-shirt is in support of that good cause, and I take this opportunity just ask everybody to, to support a uh, Movember campaign uh, generously. Now, on to, on to our business transformation. At PwC, we have um, an extensive transformation project, uh, program. It's not a project, it's a, it's a program, a series of different initiatives. Uh, technology is, of course, an enabler for our transformation, but it is not just about bringing in fancy technology. So our program, focuses primarily on upskilling our people. Uh, my colleague Christina already mentioned this and I, I heard other sort of um, participants also mentioned the importance of you know getting the workforce um, in line with the transformation objectives. So what we do is we identified early on that our people need to be upskilled in terms of the the technologies that are the technologies of the future. Uh, so acquiring these new skills they need. And I, in fact, our program has a name, it's, it's called uh, New World, New Skills. And uh, through this extensive transformation program, we focus on primarily upskilling our people into these new technologies, then introducing the technologies in our organization. And you can imagine that this covers all of the tools that have been mentioned so far from you know bi analytics tools uh, you know automation of processes that's something we use very very much uh, more recently of course integration of systems and sort of you know straight through you know execution of um, client interaction etc then our program focuses on contributing back to our clients by developing services which build on the experience of our own organization in supporting our clients with their own transformation objectives. And then finally, but also a very important part of our program is to contribute to the society in which we operate as a firm. And this is a global initiative of PwC to contribute back to, to the society under the program I mentioned before. So we have set aside you know, um, a large sum of money that uh, we, uh, including Cyprus, use to offer upskilling opportunities but technologies also to different society groups which would you know find these skills useful to be able to gain employment or to be able to do their job uh, much easier so actually in Cyprus one of the things we do is with the youth board uh, we found through various different studies that even though younger people are very familiar with social media and perhaps you know experts in using social media when it comes to using uh, digital skills more broadly they're very much behind so uh, we, we we focus on that as well now our transformation has two objectives the primary objective is to improve the experience of our own customers and our own people so it's a joint objective and then uh, as a consequence, this increases value for us and our clients. But it is important to stress the order in which these objectives take place. So primarily is the increase in the experience of our customers and our people. And then the consequence or the secondary objective is as a result to increase value. Thank you very much, uh, Vasily. So clearly, there have been different transformation efforts in the two organizations. Um, I will I will pick up on uh, Fivo's point on the importance of having a swift. Harry, are we out of time already? Uh, two more minutes. <laughs> okay, great. I will, I will I um, will ask a short question to Fivo on the importance of uh, having effective leadership alignment and engagement to have a swift decision making. Fiva, could you please comment on that a bit more? Okay, th thank you, Nicoletta. Very shortly for the sake of time, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, uh, all the right executives are involved in our governance. The board has a board transformation committee as well. 
which means uh, which means uh, monthly. Uh, the board of directors uh, as a whole is involved in the planning process and they are always uh, there for us in terms of uh, hearing our challenges, uh, which they could be related to too much on our plate or to the lack of specialized resources in some cases. They are uh, very supportive in such uh, initiatives. And also the, uh, there is frequent reporting to them in terms of monthly monitoring reports and uh, balanced scorecards. Uh, and as I said, there is a, a constant interaction actually and uh, in the course of the planning cycle and not only, therefore, there is uh, support and alignment at all times, criticism at some times, but it's always welcome and makes us improve. Great. Uh, thank you, Vivo. And I'll ask the last question to Vasilis uh, to address the comment on the collaboration between Hellenic Bank and PwC in driving their transformation efforts. Sure. Okay. Well, actually, I mean, this is a great opportunity from both organizations to learn from each other. Now, the benefit that this brings is that you get someone looking from the outside in the organization to give you a different perspective. Sometimes we do that by, you know, getting our customers to give us that insight. Now, in, PwC is also a customer of Hellenic Bank, so that also helps. But I mean, we, you know, I like to think we brought in that um, sort of fresh and unbiased perspective into how the organization could benefit or adjust its transformation program. So that's number one. But also importantly, to focus on something that is often sort of um, put on a, on, on, on a lesser priority. And this is the point of handling change. Because you know you can have the best transformation offered, introduce program, introduce the best tools, even do all the training and upskilling you need. But you need to be able to focus on how you handle this change, so that people actually adopt and use the new processes, new technologies, and they don't become an overlay, an additional burden to the organization. So change was important, and you know I'm very pleased that we're able to sort of contribute that very positive to Hellenic Bank, but also learn from them the way that this organization uh, was dealing with their own transformation program. Thank you, Vasily. So thank you both for your excellent insights into the questions that uh, were raised. It's evident that there, there's no one-size-fits-all formula for a successful transformation. We've mentioned the importance of uh, leadership engagement, uh, proper governance, having a holistic and coordinated approach, the importance of upskilling our people and having proactive change management as transformation is from what we also know a very lengthy uh, and ongoing process. So thanks again for, uh, to our panelists. Thank you all for listening and have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nicoletta. Thanks, everyone. And. Uh, I'm back on stage with uh, Kate Jordan. Hello, Kate. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us. Kate is the Vice President of Innovation Labs uh, as a service for MasterCard. Uh, Kate, can you hear me? Yes? I can hear you, yes. Hi, yes, Harry, let's hear you? you. It's uh, welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. And actually concluding our, uh, our event on digital transformation. Um, it's uh, it's in very interesting. I mean, uh, and I've and I've uh, watched this Labs as a Service from Mastercard, and I've seen you know some of your presentations before, and and uh, really looking into the future. I mean, ten and twenty and thirty years ahead. Sure. Of, uh, how you know our life is changing. You know. With, yes. Uh, uh, let's hear some of this. I mean, and uh, and uh, the stage is yours. Wonderful, Harry. Thank you so much. And I, I loved your talk earlier on as well. You had some really, really great insights there. So uh, good evening or good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here on this webinar. And I want to say thank you uh, to, to our colleagues in Cube Events for inviting me to speak to such an esteemed audience. Uh, just to give you a bit of an introduction, at MasterCard, I lead the global innovation teams uh, in Labs as a Service, and we are the external corporate innovation group. And we essentially deliver cutting edge solutions to all our clients uh, around the world. And essentially what we do is we fix big problems using technology uh, across multiple verticals and channels. And this gives us really unique insights into digital first trends to spot the opportunities um, for financial service disruption and create new product services and platforms uh, around that. 
So I'm going to take everybody now on a journey into our technology future, as Harry alluded to, and I'm going to show the show you how the world is going to fundamentally change and demonstrate the types of experiences that we're going to see um, in this next evolution of digital and social transformation. So starting off with this, 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 this first slide, um, we, we were standing on the precipice of absolutely massive, massive change. The trends that, are, that have driven the digital adoption and usage during the pandemic has shown us that technology is now the most important driver of economic growth and stability. If companies and organizations are not moving into digital first adoption, their futures are going to be decided by either further economic shocks or new agile digital competitors entering into their marketplaces. The world is going to change more in the next 25 years than it has in the previous 500. As we move into this new decade in a post pandemic world, we're going to experience an absolute explosion of technology and services that are going to impact every industry, every channel and absolutely every vertical. And the movement beyond digital transformation has already started. It's already well underway. And the next wave of technology uh, companies and platforms are going to link the digital and the physical worlds uh, together. So in, in this near future that, that, that we're talking about, we're going to interact with brands and companies using voice first location based AI enabled services built on visual CX and offered at the customer's time of need. And as digital bleeds into this physical world, new methods of consumer interaction must be imagined. But this new technology race won't be just for consumer attention. It's also actually going to be for reality itself. So to all of our, our, our guests here on this stream, welcome to the augmented age. So augmented reality, we, we kind of call this the disruption tsunami. If we think technology adoption up to this point has been disruptive and 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 has brought massive change we've seen nothing yet what's happened up to this point has been a, a, a ripple there's a wave of change coming and it's going to be driven by four key themes so coming after the industrial age the space age and the digital age which we've obviously just come out of we're going to jump into the augmented age and the four key themes are going to be experience design which is placing the customer at the absolute center of every single decision and every single product and service that an organization develops and deploys. You have to look at everything from the customer lens and orchestrate basically from that. Artificial intelligence is absolutely going to be huge. We're, also, we're already seeing AI being integrated into backend processing. Um, and, and massive automation cycles, but it's, it's here to stay and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. AI is going to be a massive, massive, massive trend. IoT uh, is also going to be essential because once we start looking at cities, once we start looking at countries and we start seeing sensor data uh, appearing across you know, multiple verticals, um, all of this data is going to build and build and build. And, and some of the previous speakers obviously, obviously spoke around data. But a couple of interesting insights on data is we're collating and collecting more data than ever before. But 80% of all data that's collected is never addressed, never looked at, never analyzed. So we all obviously have to get smarter in how we analyze this data. And specifically, when we start bringing in IoT data, which is going to be just endless amounts of data, that's where we need artificial intelligence uh, to start actually stepping in and managing some of that, that, that decisioning. Synthetic media is going to be huge as well. Synthetic media is essentially AI generated and personalized media. And if you want to think of synthetic media as, as artificial imagination, that's going to be a massive trend that we're going to see moving forward as well. So we can already see deep fakes have already been um, distributed. But in a few years time, when you actually download a movie, you're going to be able to pick the cast that you want to actually see in that movie. So if you don't like, like the lead actor, you could swap, swap them out um, for Tom Cruise, for example. So when media gets changed dynamically and personalized in real time, things get really interesting. So they're the kind of the four key trends that we'd say are, are, are driving um, um, the, the augmented age. And the essential kind of point here is, is that we're moving away from a heads down world where we consume media and services, uh, looking at screens and looking down into screens. We're moving to a heads up world where things are gonna happen in our visual eye line and it's, it's, it's gonna happen all around us. So how do we get there? The next computing platform is going to be smart glasses. 
Um, we have a number of vendors all around the world uh, working in this field. Apple, for example, have got two and a half thousand engineers alone just in Israel working on the smart computing platform or the smart glass platforms. And they're betting the future on Apple on, on uh, smart glasses. Um, so, so this 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 is going to explode. I would expect, you know, in the next eight, you know twelve to eighteen months, we're going to start seeing uh, this happening very quickly. But this is the paradigm shift in computing, and this is where we will go from the heads down world, as I said, into this heads up world. How big is this opportunity going to be when we break down virtual reality and, and augmented reality, which is which is XOR, it's about a 150 billion opportunity in the next two years. But when we break that down further, we're looking at 120 billion into augmented reality, and we're looking at about 30 billion around virtual reality. So we can see that the key driver, the key change mechanic here is absolutely gonna be augmented reality. And why is that? Because it touches off every single vertical out there in a, in a very seamless fashion. The adoption phases that we're going to look at around augmented reality will be around you know 10 million shipments emerging next year so luxotica and facebook will launch their smart glasses next year that'll start that adoption curve and we're expecting apple to start releasing potentially uh some of their glasses as well they're actually testing in the field um, at the moment by the time we get to 2023 we're looking at, at, at early majority and we're looking at potential 100 million shipments at that point but when we when it gets really interesting is by 2028 we are looking at smart glasses displacing smartphones so we're potentially looking at twice the adoption curve for smart glasses as compared to uh, smartphones and around 2028 we'll be looking at a billion shipments in total so we're looking at one market owner and then four challengers i think apple might be the main uh, market owner um, by that point and we're looking at the likes of samsung lenovo um, Microsoft and Microsoft and some other challengers. Um, but but these are the kind, kind of numbers that we're expecting uh, to happen. So what are these experiences going to look like when we move into this heads up world? So if you can imagine you're into sports, you're into fitness and you're out on your mountain bike and you're on a trail um, up on a mountain. So you can put on your smart glasses and you can now download an experience that gives you that heads up experience. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a trail that's marked out in front of you. And basically that's that's a route my friend has already taken. So I'm now gonna race him, but I'm gonna race his ghost down the mountain bike track. And then we're gonna be able to compare scores when we get to the end of the run. So in this heads up world, I'm seeing really, really, really important information, but I can visually assess this really quickly. I've got time, speed, I've got a health watch, I've got my mapping and then I've got my ghost. And um, the human brain will actually process visual uh, data about 10,000 times faster uh, than, than actually, uh, uh, you know, written data. So we can process this really quickly where we're a visual species, this is how we're wired, and this is why these types of interfaces and these experiences are gonna be so stunning. So this is a kind of a health and fitness one. When we moved into say something like medical uh, uh, and, and, and IoT experiences, when you go to the doctor in the near future, the doctor will be wearing smart glasses. So he is gonna have all of your case files at his fingertips because he's able to biometrically call up um, all of your information which is which is really really interesting he can overlay your x-rays for example um on on, on your body use using uh, uh uh computer vision and object mapping he can bring up interfaces to, to pre prescribe therapy um but what's really cool here is, is that we're getting all of this information served up that's location based biometrically based but you can interact with this in real time so this makes things far more efficient far more spa, far smarter and far more engaging but if you can imagine as i said going to see a doctor and this is the type of interface that we're going to see and um, this is really really stunning um, when we look at, say, digital twinning, for example, again, this is another key trend that we're seeing. We're starting to see organizations actually creating and spinning up digital versions, digital only versions of their company using data layers. What we're going to see in the near future as well is the ability to take your complete supply chain and lay that across your boardroom table. In real time, you can see cause and effect. If I change a price point by a couple of percentages, what does that mean across my entire supply chain? You can start looking at cause and effect in real time using digital twinning. Tesla used this a, a hell of a lot. NASA used this, this type of technique as well. So as we move beyond digital transformation and into digital twinning and live data uh, subsets, that will be a visual exercise that you, you would use smart glasses as well to manipulate and actually see cause and effect um, as we said um, in real time. We're all sitting here remotely, obviously because of the pandemic, but again, once we use our smart glasses, we will be able to, we, we, we will live on remotely um, and work remotely um, as, as, as holograms. Um, so digital humans and, and, and avatars are the next wave that's coming in. 
Uh, people might think this is far future, but uh, very recently, uh, in, in, in the past few days, it was announced that EA Sports have signed up David Beckham's digital avatar um, for the next four years to appear in uh, all of the FIFA uh, football games and the various consoles. They're paying David Beckham 300,000 uh, sterling a week uh, for his digital avatar. So David Beckham is now earning more money a week from his digital avatar playing football than his physical than his physical presence actually ever made when he was playing football. So, I mean, this is happening so quickly, but we'll start seeing remote work, we'll start seeing remote telepresence, even you know, coming to the forefront even more uh, using smart glasses and augmented reality. When we get into say children's entertainment, um, so okay, my kids uh, use you know dolls and, uh, and play toys. In the near future, your child is going to download an artificial intelligence avatar from an app store, and that avatar will become a childhood companion that will grow and age with your child in real time. So the child will be able to put on smart glasses, and this avatar will appear in front of them. So instead of just doing normal interactions, imagine the avatar is actually going to be able to teach the child how to do ballet, for example. But but as that avatar ages with the child, uh, so does all the learnings that the avatar is actually giving to the child. So it has a companion for life, but it has this, this digital avatar that is teaching, upskilling and, and doing some uh, you know, knowledge based transfer. So again, really, really exciting. Advertising will be utterly transformed as well because advertising will turn into an embedded experience. So if I'm walking through Times Square with my smart glasses and I look at a billboard, the billboard can come to life. So if it's a Land Rover advert, um, I can look at it. The Land Rover is going to drive out and park beside me. Now, I can, I can actually order a test drive in that Land Rover or I could customize it in real time. But they know who I am, they know where I am, and that vehicle could be outside my house the next day for a one-on-one -on -one test drive. So whether we like it or not, we're moving far beyond digital transformation. We're moving completely beyond digitization. We're all in the experience business. And how we engage these experiences and how we engage with consumers, it's all going to be, going to be done in a visual layer. If we look at, say, IoT, so, so not only smart glasses, but we can also look at smart windscreens. So this is an augmented reality windscreen that's using LiDAR, that's using machine vision, and it's using IoT um, sensor information. But in real time, when you look through your dash or through your windscreen here, it's showing a motorcycle, for example, on the left-hand side. It, it's measured the wheel. It knows that that motorbike is going to drive across your path. So it's flagged that in red. So you know straight away, keep your eye out, something is going to happen. We've got a couple of pedestrians on the right-hand side that potentially could step out. That's being highlighted visually to you. So what we're doing is we're not overloading um, um, you know, the spatial awareness with loads of information. We're giving nice light visual cues that you can process quickly and in real time and actually you know, manage um, all of this data flow. Really, really interesting things. So this augmented layer, these augmented superpowers that we're all essentially going to have will, will, will appear with smart glasses, augmented windscreens. We'll start seeing it, uh, you know, even in windows and trains. So you can actually change the view um, as, as, as you're commuting to work, for example. If we look at home entertainment, this gets really compelling because I've got a TV at a home, 55 inch on the wall, fantastic, brilliant. And the sitting room where I'm at home is the center of these experiences. But now if I'm using smart glasses, I can bring that experience with me. So if I'm having a barbecue in the back garden, I can drop a jumbotron in the back garden. I can put whatever content I want on, uh, on that, for example, and I can customize that into a gamified experience, a community experience uh, for me and my friends to have great fun um, outside. So when you're bleeding this digital world into this physical world, we can do exceptional things, but we're, we're, we're recreating how people interact, how they work with brands, how they engage with brands, but it's all experience led. But say, for example, I go to a live football game because live experiences are still you know, absolutely critical. Everybody's craving to get back into, into kind of crowded environments with, 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 with people. That's still applicable. But imagine I could bring my experience from the back garden, but I could, I could drop that um, in the football stadium. And whilst I'm watching a game live, I could be watching highlights from other games um, uh, you know, above the pitch um, in real time as well. This could be a, a further monetized experience that a site owner potentially could also offer 
as an engaged experience to fans attending an actual event. So as a premium type service, um, you would pay a, a few quid more on your ticket, for example, to have this level of experience. That could be one-to-one -one interviews with, you know, some of the footballers or, 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 or potentially even virtual meet and greets. But as I said, this, this digital uh, 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 magic is going to bleed into this physical world uh, very, very quickly. If we take something as simple as weather, so I can fire up my mobile phone now and I can have a look and see, you know, what the weather forecast is, is, is potentially going to be. Now, that, it only gives me a little bit of an insight as to, as to what that could be. But when I look at smart glasses, it applies the location data, the barometric pressure, and it actually wraps that around the actual cloud or, or the weather uh, uh, cycle that I'm actually looking at. So I can visually see that the storm is heading in that direction. I'm absolutely okay. I don't need to worry about it. So again, we can see health and safety uh, uh, you know, awareness here. We can do tons of stuff with this. This is absolutely amazing things. I want to finish up very briefly and talk about Fortnite as well, because I could talk around metaverses and that would be a, a, an entire presentation that I could probably go on for about two hours. Um, but persistent universes and digital worlds are, are here to stay. Uh, Fortnite has exploded. If, if any of the, the viewers on the calls here have, have, have children that are actually playing games, let them play games, encourage them to play video games. It rewires the brain. It brings out strategic intent in the brain, visual awareness, spatial awareness, strategy, fine motor skills, all the skills that kids are going to need when they enter the workforce in 15 or 20 years. So let them play games. Um, Fortnite's absolutely amazing. They've built an audience now of 350 million people playing this game. They did an event last year with Travis Scott, who's a, a, a rapper from the US. And they did a live event where he appeared on the island as an avatar. They had 12.3 million views concurrently uh, on that last year. And to give you uh, a, a comparison, the leading uh, viewership uh, uh, or the most high, highest rated show in America is the NFL on a Monday evening. That's only hitting about 8 million viewers concurrently. So Fortnite blew all of those metrics out of the water in a digital universe. It's absolutely stunning what they're absolutely doing. And again, get your kids to play games. This is Flushing Meadows last year. This is the Fortnite World Cup. 25, 30,000 people in a stadium watching people play Fortnite. And you might think that's absolutely crazy. Esports is the fastest growing sports sector uh, in the entire world. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So as I said, once the physical world starts getting bled by the digital world, we're going to start seeing this cross proliferation of new platforms, new services, new engagements, really, really amazing things. But to finish out on this one very, very briefly, Tiger Woods won $2 million last year for winning the US Open. A massive, massive amount of money. The 17 year old kid that won the Fortnite World Cup, a guy, a guy called Kyle Gersdale, his name is Booga, he won $3 million for winning the Fortnite World Cup. So he won a million dollars more than Tiger Woods did playing golf. The prize funds are building and building and building. So as esports become uh, more and more viable, more and more visible, we're going to start seeing you know, wholesale professional players uh, going into esports, but we're going to start seeing some of the esport technology bleeding into physical games on the pitch as well, which is going to be very, very interesting. So I'm conscious that I'm probably nearly um, out of time here as well. So I'm going to finish up on just a, just a, a, a you know a couple of notes here. Um, we're moving beyond digitization. If you're still thinking about digitization, you know, you're in big, big, big trouble. Digital transformation and digital first is the only way forward, but we're already moving beyond that because that, that digital world is bleeding into the physical world and be prepared for massive sea change. But we're going to explode in the next decade around technologies and services. You guys are going to create a revolution and these are exciting times. And thank you very, very much uh, for taking the time to listen, guys. Wow. Wow. Keith. Wow. Everyone is so excited. I mean, come on. Wow. Keith, it was amazing. Everyone wants to go home and play games now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, That's incredible. That is incredible, Keith. Thank you so much for that. Wow. That was truly inspirational. Couldn't have couldn't have ended the session. I'm so glad that we have you, Keith. That was just inspirational. Uh, just yeah, it just paints the picture. Literally, no pun intended. Well, pun intended. Really, just really gives us that picture of the future. And um, 
Yeah, I feel like uh, I am completely uh, blown away by that. So thank you so much, Keith. Really appreciate that. Please, everybody, reach out to Keith with any questions you may have. We did run a little bit over today. I am going to pass over to our chairman, co-chairman. Um, it's just, just incredible, Keith. Uh, just, yeah, I'm blown away thank by that. Thank you so much. Really, thank you. It changes the mindset. It really changes the way of thinking. It really, it really helps, I mean, see some things in a, in a totally different perspective. And and it's true. I mean, there's a lot of logic there. I mean, and, and I can't wait to to see all this in live. You know, it's like it makes you want to live more years to see more of this. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited, man, about uh, what you have described to us. Well, next year, hopefully, when we're, when we're back doing um, you know real events, I can I can come down and bring some of the toys that we can actually show people and put them in these worlds. For sure. That's incredible. Yeah, would love to. Would love That's to. incredible, Keith. Consider consider your invitation already uh, <laughs> <laughs> sent and accepted. Yeah. So thank you. No thank you. No we, we you know, the next event will focus on innovation, you know, you know, innovation as a service. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I've been to the innovation labs, they're incredible. So yeah, just definitely the playground for all this stuff. So Keith, thank you. We're wrapping up. Um, from thank my side, so I'd like to thank everybody again. Thank you to PwC for sponsoring today's event. Thank you to RCB for powering the Finance Leaders uh, series. Uh, thank you to Marta for all the work on the content and everything related with Cube. Thank you to Harry and to George for, for, for chairing today. Great job. George, thank you so much. You did a great job. Harry, fantastic. I think we shared amazing insights. We have put on the chat uh, the results of the polls so you can all see uh, and read what, what you all voted for in terms of the polls. We have run out of time. I will leave everybody else to say goodbye. So from my side, thank you. Thank you for all the support. Goodbye from me as well. I think I, I, I've said enough. I mean, George, thank you for co-chairing. I mean, you did great. And the moderation, looking forward to do it again. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Marta, for the producing of the event. Uh, for everyone, please have a look at the, the poll answers. Uh, thanks yeah. for, for giving your, your submitting your, um, your answers there. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure being with you. Uh, I know I've, I've learned many things and I would like to go over the webinar and check for more details that I might have missed out. Thank you very much. Yeah, and a big thank you at the end from my side as well. A special thanks for the wonderful speakers. Harry, Georgios, thank you so much for your support. And yeah, I hope to see you at our next events. <laughs> yeah, it's really great webinar to, to watch again. And, and just for those that are still with us, um, they can watch a replay. They will receive a link shortly. Uh, this is what Cube has been, has been doing. And actually perhaps share it uh, with some of, the, of your colleagues as well. Yes, we actually have the replay uh, going straight to your mailboxes. There's an evaluation form, please, if you can all fill that out so we can get your feedback, testimonials. That would be wonderful. Uh, to the CFO ICPAC committee, thank you so much. Uh, this event uh, series was in collaboration with them and we couldn't have done that without them. Uh, just great sessions all round, great speakers all round, great feedback all round. So thank you to everybody, our chairman, Marta, wonderful. We're closing off. Panayati, let's end the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, all have have a good evening. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.